Good morning. This is January 11, 2023. Clark County Council, Washington. We begin with our council retreat. And immediately after that, we turn to a very brief agenda. <coughs> excuse me. That is for council time today. I will mention that um, the decision has been made that if we don't finish with retreat items today, they will be continued on January 18. And in addition, there is, <coughs> excuse me, a separate agenda for the retreat for January 18. So given that uh, we intend to cut off discussion at noon so that we will uh, be able to um, give appropriate time to all of the items. <clears throat> so uh, let's begin with open public comment, and that is to be comment that is on the agenda that is before us. Uh, you know the routine. If you're in the hearing room, if you would let it be known to staff your interest in speaking, otherwise star three, or uh, hit the icon appropriately on your laptop. Staff, do you see anyone who wishes to comment from the public? No, Chair, we do not have anyone. Okay, very good. Well, let's go to council introductions. And uh, Kathleen, would you like to kick that off? Sure, I thought it would be um, good for council and the community just to have council introduce themselves a little bit about your background and why you decided to run and serve Clark County. Uh, we do have a lot of new counselors um, that have recently joined. So, um, and anything else that you would like to share um, either to your fellow counselor staff or the community with regards to communication or anything that you think is important. Um, so. With that said, we'll start with Councilor District 1, uh, Councilor Young. I think I'm going to grow to hate that number one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to work with all of you. It's an honor to have this privilege and opportunity to represent the people in Clark County and specifically District 1. And a bit about my background, I think most people here know, but I have a busy life for sure. I've got five kids at home, lovely wife that does an amazing job at keeping everything together and functioning at home. And um, we own a small remodeling company. Generally speaking, all we've done is remodel work over the last few years, however, have made somewhat of a change and have focused my um, my business on ADUs, accessory dwelling unit building them in mostly downtown Vancouver. And uh, that is, between those two things, has kept us very busy, but I am very happy to be here. And, uh, you know, I, I really believe in working together to solve solutions. And so I intend to be fully productive in building connections with everybody and making sure that we have a good and open line of communication and that we understand each other and that we have our differences, but we work through them. Um, and that we show the county that we're united as a council and staff and, and working the very best that we can to make Clark County a very good place for everyone that chooses to live here. So I'm happy to be here. And just a couple subjects that are very passionate of mine is working with our community to come up with new solutions for homelessness. And I really want to end it. And that has a lot to do with affordable housing. And so those two issues along with mental health, those are the three things that I'm very much interested in. Thank you. Councillor Belcott. We'll get used to this microphone. <laughs> Hi, I'm Councillor Michelle Belcott, um, District 2, which I've said this probably 5 million times. I like to say this because a lot of people are not familiar with what district they're in. Um, it's Salmon Creek, Salida, Hazeldale, Minnehaha, and out to Five Corners a little bit after the recent redistricting. Um, my background is I've been a civil servant for about 25 years, um, working in contracting and procurement. 
I'm a senior analyst at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, I've been in the military recently, retired for 25 years in several different leadership capacities, um, a Naval Reserve Supply Corps officer and also in the Air Force um, as a Master Sergeant. Uh, I ran for county council because I'm very passionate about Clark County. I grew up here um, K through 12. I moved back here about eight years ago to raise my kids. Um, I was really concerned about some of the things that were going on, um, which really activated me and motivated me to get involved with the county council and run for this position. Um, I'm humbled to be in this position without the voters and their support, I would not be here. So it is because of my constituents in District 2 that I'm even here today. Um, I'm passionate about many different things that are going on in the county, so um, I think this discussion for the retreat will really help me narrow down to what I'm pretty interested in, and I'm excited to be here, and thank you so much, and I cannot wait to get to know all of you. Thank you. Councillor Methodji. I didn't know you were going to call on me. Believe it or not, I'm now the longest sitting councillor. Who would have thought just a few years ago? Uh, so I was uh, retired. At least I came up here after a global search, uh, pick a place to retire back in 2015, moved up here in 2016. I thought I was just going to enjoy aviation and all my charitable endeavors regarding aviation in the community, especially with our youth. and. Um, particularly some of our disadvantaged youth. However, then there was an open seat and I had a few people encourage me to say, boy, you've got some great credentials. Why don't you put your hat in the ring? And I said, sure, why not? I always wanted to be a politician. That was tongue in cheek. Um, anyway, uh, I was appointed, became uh, the counselor for fourth district, which used to be <laughs> most of the county up north and east. Um, so the most rural area uh, ran twice, and um, here I am. Um, I have a, lot, a number of ongoing projects that have been going on that I keep uh, reminding the manager of uh, for the last four years from Camp Bonneville to Heritage Farm to our railroad, um, broadband, homeless, we are on good track, at least on the county right now, with all of our new metrics and focus on better outcomes. Um, working with our other cities and stakeholders, especially on the broadband issue and homeless issue, um, helped create the ECHO team that we have now and also the joint uh, committee that we had previously to work on homeless issues. Uh, that's all kind of nascent and moving forward, uh, but my goal had always been to just make our county government more efficient and better uh, for everyone. Um, I answer to every constituent's call, no matter what district they've been in. And some of the other counselors in their districts have asked me to help because they know I'm goal oriented. I want outcomes. I don't wanna just keep working on things like Lake Vancouver and Lackamas Lake, I want to start doing things that fix the problems that we have. I um, come from a law enforcement family. I spent 30 years in the law enforcement community. And uh, so believe me, I am joined at the hip with law enforcement from our local chiefs to our sheriff. Uh, I want to do everything we can for public safety um, and our every citizen. Councilor Marshall. Thank you. Uh, so I'm Sue Marshall. I represent uh, Council District 5, uh, which I took over a lot of your territory, Councilor Medvedji. Uh, it's the northern, I think it's about half of uh, the geographic area of the county. Um, my family has been farming in Clark County for over 60 years, and my husband and I took over the farm eight years ago 
because we wanted to uh, really invest in the farm and keeping go keeping it going as an economic entity. Uh, I, I became involved with a number of uh, issues and community service in Clark County with the Clean Water Commission, and I uh, served about a term and a half with the Clark Conservation District. My uh, career had been in public service in uh, various capacities, working for nonprofit, local, and state government, and always uh, interested in issues of hunger and conservation uh, and um, community involvement in the process. So one of the reasons that I decided to run uh, was the upcoming update of the comprehensive plan. A lot of what I talked to people about when I was going door to door was about development. There's been a lot of growth in Clark County. People are concerned about its impact on the roads and the schools. So universally that was a concern that folks have and we talk about balanced growth and what that might look like. And I think fundamental to having balanced growth is that everyone have an opportunity to be engaged in the process. So I would just encourage everyone to pay attention because the next uh, three years we'll be working uh, pretty extensively on that. So I'm just excited for the opportunities. Uh, I, I'm a problem solver as well. And I think in this position, uh, it's, uh, it's a very, very much a privilege to be in this position. And I'll just be looking for opportunities to make things better. Thank you. And Chair Bowerman. It's my pleasure to serve District 3. Chair, you're this, mute. Uh, I don't show that I am. We just unmuted you on our end. Okay, very good. Well, it's my pleasure to serve with District 3 and, of course, as the, the chair this year, as last year, for the uh, Clark County Council. Um, my background is uh, maybe not unlike some of yours. My, uh, I, I started working uh, actually full time at age 13 on a work permit, and I was with Kansas Farmer Magazine at that time. And I remember um, making my first house payment for my mom at age 13. And that work ethic has been a part of my soul ever since. And uh, I think that carries over into what I chose as my career which was for uh, almost 40 years, over, over 35, working in the Cal State University system. I was in the College of Business and Public Administration and served uh, two of the universities in the CSU as dean of that college. Um, and, you know, it's, it was such a great ride there because the CSU is not a rich university by any stretch. And yet our college was uh, declared because of the teamwork and innovation of the, the faculty with whom I had the privilege of working. We were named one of the most, uh, one of the uh, 14 or was it 12? I think it was 12 most innovative colleges of business with programs for students in the world. And that came from French uh, sources to give us that designation. So that's the way I like to approach the work setting as a team working together to accomplish quality. And I feel like that is precisely what we are doing in Clark County. Um, I could tell you uh, more because the backgrounds that we have uh, and the reasons that we love Clark County are so many, but I won't bore you with that this morning, maybe later. <laughs> so for now, we turn to item three, the charter overview. Uh, Chair Bowerman, before we get started on the next presentation, I did notice that um, this has been noticed for CBTV. It sounds like they're not here um, at the moment. So if we can take just a quick pause so that we can try to get a hold of them and see if they can even do it remotely to get this broadcasted online uh, so that we're meeting what we actually said we're going to do. We have recorded uh, the first part with the introductions, correct? That is correct, yes. Maybe they could utilize that information in some way 
with a nice background about Clark County visually or something so that it's not lost. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we are gonna give them a quick call right now and see if they can log on. And if, if we don't get a response, we'll continue with the recording and then we'll send our apologies publicly. Great. Well, let me just say while we're waiting, I've heard from the public appreciation for the fact that this is broadcast. It's, it, it is after all, not a Yes, and with that, I would like to apologize to the community because that was certainly uh, not our intent that this be absent uh, video. Um, so now we turn to the charter overview, county charter overview. Yes, if we could pull up the presentation. Great, thank you. So Leslie and I will be tag teaming on this discussion um, and feel free to ask questions as we go through or wait till the end, whatever you prefer. This is just to provide an overview of the Clark County Charter, which really defines how we govern and how we conduct our business. Next slide, please. So just a brief history, uh, the charter was adopted um, by voter approval in November 2014. It was effective on January 1st, 2015. And the, basically it established the separation of the executive and legislative powers within Clark County. There has been a couple other updates both in 2021 and 2022 that were also voter approved that we will discuss towards the end of this presentation. The first article of the charter really talks about the powers of the county. Again, the two branches, which is the legislative and executive. Legislative is the county council, executive is the county manager, and the separate elected officials. Um, each branch has its own responsibilities, um, and all branches or both branches can't interfere or extend their authority into another branch. There's more information on what is uh, permitted for both branches within this uh, presentation that's also outlined in the charter. The intergovernmental relations basically is uh, stating that the county may work with other governmental agencies and corporations uh, through interlocal agreements or other agreements um, to help fulfill the services and the functions of the county. Again, the legislative branch is the county council. The term for counselors is four years. It defi uh, this defines the organization, such as the chair and the vice chair. The majority of the council does con constitute a quorum. Uh, the council can take actions by vote of at least a majority of the members. And then we do have the rules of conduct for business um, identified in Article 2, as well as the rules of procedure, which is identified later and as an addendum to the charter. Additional information on the legislative branch. This summarizes some of the powers of the county council. The council is responsible for providing policy for Clark County. I just want to take a pause. Council Marshall, do, can we try to? Okay. Okay. She's got sun right in her eyes, so I want to make sure she um, was comfortable. Um, the council also adopts ordinances, resolutions, and provides motions for uh, making decisions for the county. Um, through the budget prop, uh, process, the council does approve the, pro, or the budget, um, including the levy taxi, taxes and appropriate revenues. Um, with regards to human resources and personnel, the only authority that the council has is providing the compensation philosophy and the parameters. That includes compensation and benefits. I'm still on there, sorry. I'm getting an update on CBTV. Um, uh, the council does um, review the comprehensive plan and land development codes. Um, public hearings, these are done as established by law or significant decisions. And so those are usually tied to the Tuesday meetings and at the end of the Tuesday meeting. Uh, collective bargaining, the council does establish the bargaining parameters and then the county manager and HR actually conduct, conduct bargaining on behalf of the council. And then with boards and commissions, there's three uh, boards and commissions that the council has the sole responsibility of appointing. That is the Historic Preservation Commission, the Board of Equalization, and the Planning Commission. 
There are other boards and commissions that are done jointly with the county manager and council. And basically those uh, staff and sometimes board members interview, provide recommendations that come to council for either acceptance or rejecting. The rules of procedure is also identified in article two. Uh, this again is really how the council will conduct business. It, adopt, um, it is required to adopt the rules of procedure per the charter. We will go over the rules of procedure, I believe, following this presentation. Again, it identifies when council will have meetings, the location, the time, um, so that the public is aware and you know, we're providing that transparent process. The council does adopt, again, all ordinances. Um, all of our meetings are open to the public except executive session, which is identified in RCW of what is permitted during executive session. And there are times when council can meet where there's more than three that does not require um, open public, uh, actually open public comment or the public to um, join. An example of this is attending a conference. Um, so the council can do that. It is recommended that um, we're not having discussions with three, P three counselors or more. And if so, if there's, that's unavoidable, then it's recommended that you don't talk about county business because that does constitute a quorum and we wanna ensure that we're uh, following the rules established by the state of Washington. Again, the relationship, um, 2.6 really identifies the relationship with the other branches. Um, the council um, cannot interfere with the administration of the executive branch, which is, which is the county manager branch, and the separate electeds. Uh, the council shall not issue orders or direct employees under supervision of the county manager or elected official. Um, and I will just say, and I, I know I've shared this in our 101s, even if we have operational items that's not under council's purview, I usually give and provide an update to council just for your awareness. Um, but, and I'm always open to feedback, but per the charter, um, council cannot go to an employee and direct what they're doing, tell them how to do it. It's really the policy role. Um, the council may refer citizen complaints and resident complaints um, or request information of the county manager or a separate elected official. Um, and then council can also request uh, to the county manager to work with the department head and to investigate constituent issues. And our process internally has been council can forward that information to me on an email and then I will coordinate with the appropriate staff to get an answer to provide back to the council. Some counselors prefer that we send the response directly to the constituent, um, but we will make sure that we're communicating and close um, all open discussions and questions that council may have. Again, the executive branch includes the county manager and our six elected officials separate elected officials, including the assessor, the auditor, the treasurer, the sheriff, and the prosecuting attorney and the clerk. Um, and again, council members shall not interfere in the administration of the executive branch. The only role that council has with regards to the separate branch is adopting a budget. Uh, once that budget is adopted and approved by council, it is up to um, the separate elected officials or the county manager departments to spend that and that authority. So the only authority has it, that council has with um, regards to the other elected is the uh, budget adoption and comp compensation and classification. Uh, section 3.2 does talk about the county manager portion of the executive branch. Um, the majority of the council does appoint the county manager. There was a charter amendment that was passed by voters this year, and it basically says that prior to appointing a county manager, the council will confer and consult with the separate electives just to get their feedback. They do not have any voting authority, but it's simply just to get their feedback because many of our departments support the separate electives. Um, and so during such time, there will be, and, and that feedback I believe will, be, will happen in a public meeting as well. Um, the council does establish the terms of employment um, by written contract with the county manager. It's much like a professional services agreement that we do for other services. So it's a contract. The um, human resources policy and other policies do not apply to the county manager. Um, because all of the terms of employment are within the, that contract. 
Additionally, uh, the county manager does serve as the chief executive officer for the county, uh, supervising all administrative departments that are not part of the separate elected departments, um, prepare and present the budget to the council, determine what's the appropriate organizational structure to ensure that we're providing a timely and efficient service in our community, uh, manage all the properties that are owned by the county, and appoint the chief officers of each administrative department that's not under an elected, which is our directors and our department heads. The executive elected officials is also part of the administrative or executive branch. Again, that includes the six separate electeds. Um, they also have the authority to appoint all of their employees um, and their officers within their department. They are required to comply with the county's human resources policy. There are times when an elected can have their own HR policy um, outside of the Clark County Human Resources policy and you know, may be more clarity and different um, parameters. The one policy that electives cannot have is under what's under the county's council's purview, which is the compensation and benefits. Um, and with all of our policies, all of those changes would have to be bargained with all the unions and guilds as well. And Article 4 does establish the financial administration um, and the parameters and authority um, within the county. So the county manager is considered the chief financial officer for the county. Um, there is a process in which we prepare preliminary budgets. Our budget office actually manages that processes. It's very collaborative with departments and elected offices um, and also with our finance team. And the preparing the budget is established by law, so there are parameters that we have to meet pursuant to RCW to ensure that we are meeting that regulation. Um, and also by law, we have to have a balanced budget that is approved for the following year. The auditor's office does um, have also some responsibility, both within the charter and per RCW, and they're responsible for the financial administration. So they actually are supposed to be uh, providing reports on our actual revenues and expenses throughout the year. Um, I know Mark Gassaway, their finance director, has provided that information recently and will continue to do so quarterly moving forward in 2023. And then the duties of the treasurer um, is specified under federal law, statutes, and the Washington State Constitution. Article 5 is the human resources uh, section of the charter. This um, section 5.2 does identify with the council's authority. I know we've already talked about this already, but any compensation policy, such as compensation and benefits, are under the purview of the council. Uh, the merit pay and step increase programs is also under council's authority. The merit pay would be the overall wage adjustments that may be approved on an annual basis with um, both represented and non-represented employees. Um, determining benefits and eligibility and also in insurance benefit plans, eligibility and employee contributions. And 5.3 um, of the human resources section of the charter, it does identify the county manager authority, which is to develop, implement, and administer HR policies. Um, council does not approve HR policies except those that were listed in 5.2, which is the compensation and benefits. So all of the other, and benefits would include time off and any other benefit outside of compensation. Um, there is because you have that authority too with the, and I believe it's gonna be on another slide here as well, but again, with collective bargaining, um, the parameters are established by the council in executive session, and then the county manager and HR will provide the collective bargaining uh, um, negotiations process. Kathleen, if I could just jump in for a moment. This is Leslie Lopez. I just wanted to make a quick comment about executive session. There's a statute that specifies what can be discussed in executive session. And um, in addition, uh, those items that are discussed in executive session are confidential and cannot be um, shared with the public. So that is, I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. Section 5.6 um, talks about employment and status as an elected official. So basically no county elected um, can hold another office or employment within the county government during their term of office. 
Uh, 5.7 is regarding privilege, um, which is also similar to ethics. No um, employee or the council or elected official or myself, um, we cannot use our positions to secure employment or privileges for others and using influence. Um, nor can we solicit or accept any benefit, compensation, profit, um, or other uh, direct or indirect um, that's outside of our duties. And one thing that our auditor's office does have a policy with regards to like going to conferences and if you're getting free things at conferences, there is a process in place in which we need to abide by to ensure we're following the rules. <clears throat> at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Leslie who will start um, with Article 6. Uh, Madam Chair, is there any way we can make comments or questions before we move on? I think that's a good idea. Otherwise, things get buried a bit. Would that be okay, Kathleen? Absolutely. Go ahead, Councillor Med. Thank, Thank you. If I could just begin with a very brief comment. So, one, you know, our charter changed pretty dramatically when it went from commissioners to councillors. And for at, at my beginning of my tenure, I still considered that somewhat of uh, an experiment as everyone was sorting through uh, everyone's new respective roles. Uh, now we're, it's somewhat maturing. Uh, I think we're, and it's all generally working pretty well. I think we have very good relations uh, with uh, with the manager as well as with other elected officials. But here are two points. Uh, the first is, I think our charter review uh, process is, is really pretty dismal. And I'd like to take that on and put on our, on, on our own, because uh, we can do so uh, every year. I mean, and just to highlight one point, you know, at no point was any elected official, including the manager, who participated in, as far as I know, almost every single meeting, ever asked, what changes do you need to make government work better? Not one elected official was ever substantive query as to what changes we needed to make. And I think there are a few that would improve uh, how we operate, some big, some small. Uh, the other one I want to point out, especially with the, uh, the sheriff in, in the room, you know, and it came up a couple times in your slides, collective bargaining. And it was, you know, I, I learned something every week uh, as a counselor. And uh, one of the things I learned during the process of trying to really support the sheriff's department was, oh my gosh, we approved all this money. We uh, almost 95% of what the sheriff at the time had asked for. Yet because it immediately flipped into collective bargaining, no one knew. And we took a lot of heat. The public really thought, oh my gosh, the Clark County Council does not support the Sheriff's Department. And it was, and I questioned, I believe it was Leslie, it may have been another attorney, I said, why are we doing this? We just approved all this money, why don't we just give it to the Sheriff to manage? And the answer is the charter. You know, the county manager is responsible for collective bargaining and uh, all of that immediately went into an executive session and we couldn't make any of that public at, on any level. Uh, so there was a false information out there that we weren't supporting the sheriff when we actually were and it all derives from what the charter said on responsible uh, duties um, as far as negotiating contracts. Now, clearly, you wouldn't want to telegraph to any union, hey, here's how much we've approved uh, ahead of time before you get into collective bargaining, but there's certainly ways to do that. So um, I, I just throw those two comments out that I think we really should take a look as a council at how the Charter Review Commission, when it comes up, approaches this task as a process. And then uh, I don't know that there's anything we can do about collective bargaining, but there's, there's got to be some way um, to let the public know and have more transparency. I mean, as a counselor, I just kept telling everyone every time I got some hate mail on the email, no, this isn't true. We do support the sheriff. We have approved all this money. We're doing our best. Uh, and until the guilds approve their respective contracts, we couldn't make it public. Anyway, I'll get off that soapbox. Yeah, and I believe uh, Leslie, part of her um, 
pro in the presentation, she'll go over the process if council wants to um, put something on the ballot and changing the um, <coughs> charter and put that for vote. Um, I also want to just share that there, there's also executive um, or RCW that outlines public employees in the bargaining process. So I think this is consistent with that. Um, and you are correct, Councilor Mavaji, we do not uh, discuss the specific parameters publicly um, that were established. But with that said, the administration in the Sheriff's Office was aware that we had parameters and that we were in bargaining. And we can always say that we are in bargaining. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but I agree with you. Unfortunately, there was some information um, or assumptions, and I know sometimes lack of information creates um, it will be created. And unfortunately, there is only so much that you can share, but you know, just to echo your comments, I would ask the community and staff to, you know, when we're bargaining, we're doing it in good faith. And we do wanna bring that to closure. And I would hope that all would respect that process as we move forward. Um, Kathleen, I wondered if we could return briefly to slide number seven. There was something there that uh, bothered me a bit. Uh, and I, I frankly had forgotten about it. It's on slide seven. Um, and that is, uh, and what bothers me is when the council gets information from constituents that then drops into that deep dark hole and disappears. And this deals with the last two bullets that say may, we may refer citizen complaint or request for information to the county manager. I've always thought of it and in fact have communicated it to new counselors that it was our responsibility to refer on citizen complaints. Sometimes those complaints come only to the council. And if we fail to refer them on, then they do drop into that 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 hole uh, and tend to disappear. Comment on that, please. Yes, I would always recommend if you have constituent concerns that you do not have firsthand knowledge on how to respond, to please send them to me so that we can get an appropriate response. Um, sometimes constituents don't like the response, but they deserve a response. So if you, and we don't look at your email, so if you could please forward them, that would be great. And I can't remember if it's in the charter or in the rules of procedure. It does talk about the chair being responsible for the constituent um, response. Um, but we are um, developing a, a, an additional, we have some tracking mechanism on that, but we're gonna develop some more to be more transparent with council as well to ensure that the responses are getting done and done timely. That's great. And I don't re recall where these words may come from. I don't know if that's in the charter or, or where that was taken from, but I, I think that um, if we could drop them, that would be really, really good. Chair Bearman, I can um, add some clarification to that. Um, so the slide that you're talking about um, is section 2.6. So it's talking about the relationship with other branches. So basically it's explaining how the branches are supposed to work with each other, right? And so the charter language actually says when it relates to referring citizen complaints or requesting information, it says nothing contained herein shall prohibit a council member from, and then it's referring a citizen complaint or submitting a request for information, submitting a um, requesting information or advice pertinent to the legislative deliberation. So, um, so the, the language that says may is not actually in the charter. That's just to reference the relationship that a counselor can do that. Um, but I agree that it's a good idea for counselors to be doing that. Um, it just had to do with the relationship between the branches. Uh, thank you, and, and I see it even beyond, not just as a good idea, but as a responsibility. So I don't know if that's something that we could talk about relative to another aspect of our uh, guidelines, but uh, uh, it, because if it doesn't come from the uh, charter, I presume that we can go beyond that in, a, in an affirmative way on behalf of constituents. That's, those are my thoughts. 
Chair, could I make a real quick comment? Surely, go ahead, Councillor. Sure, I, I just I appreciate this conversation because it would be very helpful for us to have a bit more organized system on this because when we receive an email, we don't know. I mean, sometimes somebody will send an email in that is, you know, copying all of us and we can see that in the header information, but some individuals may copy and paste an email or maybe, you know, make it a little bit individualized and send essentially the same complaint to each council member. And it would be helpful to make sure we aren't you know, somebody else's multiple people aren't working on the same issue and um, that, you know, we're aware that the other council members are aware of that complaint and, and that type of thing. So I appreciate this discussion. Yeah, and that's and why I, I think it's helpful your comment to... Because uh, since there are limitations on more than two of us speaking uh, with each other or emailing, we don't know what the other counselors are doing, right? So thank you for that. And I think to help with that process is since I'm your central hub for that information, there are times I'll get three different emails that are the same email, you know, but I'll know who to contact to get a response and then we'll make sure that um, that the counselor who provided it, because some of it's not a county wide, it might be a district specific, um, but we'll make sure whoever is providing the information that it, it's closed back through the counselor. Chair, this is Sue Marshall. I'd like to make a comment. Yes, Sue. Uh, I, I believe we'll have an opportunity to discuss this in more detail because under the rules of procedure, the, uh, under uh, chair and vice chair, uh, it mentions that the, uh, uh, the chair will supervise constituent response processes for the council as a whole. And uh, so that maybe that's something we can de develop further. Chair, may I have a moment? Um, I actually was talking to um, Chair Bowerman about this a few days ago as well because I've already received an email and I asked about a SharePoint tracking system or if the county has something so as that we can track the complaint, where it's gone, what department, because it's, it's going to be a learning curve for the new counselors to know who to route some of the information to or yourself, Kathleen. Um, so I had wondered if, if there was some mechanism for that so that it doesn't get lost with one of the departments or um, or even with us, depending on workload. Yeah, we do have, I believe, a couple, both our office and, but we don't always see everything either. So, um, and some departments have their own independent like Excel spreadsheets, but we will be developing a program that incorporates all of it so that we can track everything from the response because you know, one of the things, it's not just about responding in a timely response, it's are we getting the same issue brought up multiple times that maybe the council needs to look at code. Maybe the code doesn't make sense anymore. So we need to take that extra step as well and bring that information to the council so we can you know, fix anything that may need to be fixed. And Chair Bowerman and council, just one more comment on this topic. It's my understanding with the um, Article two in the relationship with the other branches that if um, items are brought from constituents that that information is generally provided to the county manager who then contacts um, separate um, the departments that are under the county manager. So unless, you know, if Kathleen has a different point, but that's my understanding. And nothing prohibits the council, um, I mean, if you can reach out to the other separate electives as well. And I know some counselors have done that. If some jurisdictions cross over a little bit, sometimes it shares off as some public works issue that they're working jointly. Um, and I, I'll look at the, our sheriff here in the room, but I don't think there's any issue with, you know, sending it to me and the sheriff or, and the elected official so that we can ensure that we're getting the response as well from both parties. Okay, thank you. If we could go, um, see which slide is it? It would be slide 16, please. Almost there. Um, Article 16 has to do with elections and districts. Um, and the charter was amended in uh, recently, 2021, that the offices of the council members, assessor, auditor, clerk, sheriff, treasurer, and prosecuting attorney are now nonpartisan offices. 
However, the elections for the office shall be conducted in the manner provided for partisan local elections. Section 6.3 talks about the qualifications of those holding an elected office. Um, they're the general items. They have to be a citizen of the United States, um, at least 18 years old, registered voter of Clark County. And if it is regarding a council member, um, they have to reside in the district in which they are running for. <laughs> Section 6.4 talks about district boundaries, and there is a, a Attached to the charter, there's an Appendix A, which has the current district map. Section 6.5 talks about the redistricting committee. And uh, I won't go through the entire section, but basically provides the information that is required and the timing for when redistricting occurs. Um, and that is... Uh, there's a committee that's appointed, and then they go through the process of looking at the districts and having open meetings to discuss um, a redistricting plan. Section 6.6 .6 talks about that redistricting plan and how that is adopted um, by the county. So this section, section 6.7, is a new section. It was approved by the voters in November last year. Um, it's entitled Vacancy, and it relates to uh, two different items. It talks about when an elected office becomes vacant, and then it talks about how to fill those vacancies. Section 6.7a states that an elective office shall become vacant upon an incumbent's death, resignation, recall, conviction of a felony, a crime involving moral turpitude, unlawful destruction of public records, or other crime pertinent to their office. The next, okay, this will talk about the county counselor, but the there is one that talks about um, how the separate electeds fill their vacancy, and uh, what they're required to do is to file an official document with the auditor that designates one or more employees to serve as their chief deputy or, or manager. And it's my understanding that all the separate electeds have completed this. This particular slide talks about the, we can stand that on this slide, thank you. Um, this one talks about the vacancy of an elected county counselor. And what it states is that a majority, once there is a vacancy, a majority of the county council shall fill the county council vacancy by appointment until it has been filled by election or the successor to the office has been elected and qualified according to state law. Um, the part that's new, and we can go to the next, I believe it's on the next slide. Oh, nope, I was wrong. Sorry, go back. Um, this is just my notes instead of on the slide. So one thing that has changed is that um, the council is required to adopt a counselor vacancy policy. And I'll just read this straight from the charter. It says, the council shall adopt a counselor vacancy policy that describes the procedures to fill a vacant counselor position, which shall include a public notice of the vacancy and an application process that is hold, held open for a period of 21 calendar days or more. The charter amendment itself did not indicate, you know, when this policy needs to be completed. However, um, in looking at the charter itself, um, section 9.3 talks about charter amendments and when they are um, implemented. So section 9.3B2 states that amendments approved by majority of the voters shall be effective 10 calendar days after the results of the election are certified unless there's a date that's different um, in the amendment. And implementing ordinances required by a charter amendment, which this is, shall be enacted by the council within 180 days after the charter amendment is effective. So I, I did the math, and basically the council would be responsible for adopting a counselor vacancy policy on or before June 6th of this year. We can move 
to the next slide, unless there's any questions on this chapter. Okay. So Article 7 um, has to do with uh, the initiative and referendum. So this is the powers of the people of Clark County to make certain proposals and to approve or reject them at the polls. There are limitations to initiatives. Uh, they are limited by state or federal law. There are certain procedures regarding the initiatives. Um, I won't go through the entire thing, but Article 7 sets out the number of votes that are required, the filing dates, and the times that uh, those petitions are required to be the, um, submitted to the auditor's office. There's also a mini initiative process. This again, these are also limited by state or federal law. And they can also be proposed to the council. There's an initiative that has signatures totaling no less than 3% of the number of votes cast in the county in the last um, election. And it states the process um, for the hearing and um, dealing with the mini initiative. The referendum is uh, maybe ordered on any ordinance. And it states that the following ordinances are limited by state law and are not subject to referendum. Those include emergency ordinances, ordinance providing for compensation or working conditions for the county employees, or ordination ordinances authorizing or repealing an appropriation of money that's already in the budget. Ordinances authoring or repealing taxes or ordinances required by state or federal law. The referendum procedure is also listed in terms of the timing of when items are filed with the auditor. And the process of how um, the council approaches that. The last item in this um, article it has to do with recall and it just states that the people reserve the power of recall. Are there any questions on this particular? Okay, yes. Madam Chair, I have a question. And uh, I'll start the question with a comment. So uh, we really, uh, from the state level down, we really don't have a, a very solid process on legal review on what the public may tee up uh, and through the initiative process or many initiative process, meaning, I mean, there, unless a lawsuit is brought by a, a PA or attorney general and gets the issue before the court saying, hey, this isn't a legitimate topic, you know, or this would have an unlawful outcome. It would be contrary to federal or state law. We can't do it. There is no real process to filter out those. Uh, and that kind of gets me to the question that just came up recently with another jurisdiction. And I don't know if it's different than what Clark County has. I understand there's a referendum going on right now on um, a tax increase in Camas. Is that a subject that could be brought up by members of Clark County? You know, when this council raises property taxes or other taxes, uh, could that be the subject of a referendum? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Medvedji. Um, I would obviously like to research that issue, but I'm just I'm looking at the language of the charter, and it says under Section 7.4. A has referendum limitations, and one of the items listed is ordinances authorizing or repealing taxes or fees. So that language seems to indicate that it's not subject to referendum. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions regarding this article? Yes, I've got a quick question. So when we when we spoke about the process of appointment in the event of a council vacancy. Where is that process? I, I don't think it's in the rules and procedures. Is, is it somewhere else? It's not currently in the rules of procedure. 
um, but that is part of what the new amendment requires is that the council come up with a policy and that will be contained in the rules of procedure. That's the, the item that needs to be completed by June of this year. Okay, so that's gonna be coming before us in the near future. And I anticipate that we'll have that on a council time agenda for discussion and then based on what the council wants, staff will go back and draft something, bring it back to another council time to review and see if there's any additional edits. And then once we're done, it will go to a public hearing uh, for final consideration. Chair, I have a uh, question. Is, is there a process for legal review related to uh, state and federal law, whether or not an um, initiative or a mini initiative is compliant with state law? Um, thank you, Councilor Marshall. I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, um, yes, actually, that is um, part of the duties of the prosecuting attorney's office is to provide legal advice regarding um, whether uh, an initiative or mini initiative um, is legal in terms of the law. And so, yes, our office would complete that analysis and would provide it to the council. I just want to add a comment to that because we did do that with the mini initiative, uh, but it doesn't prevent it from getting on the ballot. You know, the auditor has to, if certain criteria are met, the auditor just puts it on the ballot. So even though the PA and uh, a lot of common sense would say, geez, this is gonna conflict with not only federal but state law, um, it still went on the ballot. But we waived attorney-client privilege with that opinion so that we could then make it public during the process. So the greater public would know, hey, here's why we voted this down, because it was an unlawful outcome. It does, it does seem a bit awkward, though, and it went a long way forward before, before that occurred. Thank you. Yes, so the way the charter is written, uh, we are required to go through the process. There isn't an ability to screen things. For instance, it has to go through the process and the public comment and public meeting. Thank you. Okay, we can go ahead and move to the next slide, please. So Article A um, talks about ordinances, enactment of ordinances, emergency ordinances, resolutions, motions, and a lot of other items. Um, so just some spe specifics about ordinances is um, they shall not contain more than one subject. Um, all county ordinances shall become part of the Clark County Code. The council shall establish by ordinance the procedures to codify ordinances, correct deficiencies and conflict, conflicts, and make technical revisions, remove obsolete provisions. The enactment of an ordinance is it can be introduced by any council member or by many initiative. The council shall hold at least one public hearing after due notice to consider the proposed ordinance. During that hearing, a proposed ordinance may be amended by motion, provided the amendment does not change the scope and object of the proposed ordinance. Final passage of an ordinance by council requires a roll, it's a roll call vote, not just um, yay or nay. Um, each individual counselor would be asked for their vote, and it requires a minimum of three affirmative votes for adoption. Ordinances will then take effect 10 days after enactment. Section 8.3 talks about the repeal and amendment of an ordinance. Amendment of an ordinance requires presentation of the amended section at length. And ordinances repealing provisions of county code shall include the ordinance reference to the affected code. And when ordinances are amended, a public hearing is also required, similarly to how an ordinance is enacted. Section 8.4 talks about emergency ordinances. Um, a proposed ordinance may be enacted as an emergency ordinance if the council finds as a fact and states in the ordinance 
that the ordinance is necessary for the immediate preservation of public peace, health, or safety, or for the support of county government and its existing public institutions. And the vote for an emergency ordinance is different. It requires a minimum of four affirmative votes to enact an emergency ordinance. And emergency ordinances are effective immediately upon passage. Section 8.5 talks about resolutions. Resolutions are meant to express the council's opinion of items of business or administration, but they don't have the force of law. Section 8.6 talks about motions. The council may pass motions to confirm or reject nominations or appointments, organize and administrate, administer the legislative branch, And it's to, you know, pass, uh, it's the essential function that is used to pass the council's business. Section 8.8 .8 talks about purchasing contracts, claims, and bonds. Basically states that the council shall, by ordinance, establish procedures for those items, and that is contained in the county code. Franchises, all franchises granted by the council shall be for a fixed term, not to exceed 25 years. Section 8.10 talks about public disclosure, and it states that public disclosure of the financial interests of Clark County officials and employees shall be governed by county ordinance. In November of 2021, a, count, a charter amendment was passed, uh, Section 8.2 and Section 8.5. I'm sorry, excuse me, section 8.12 and section 8.13, which established the code of ethics. Section 8.12 states the council shall adopt an ordinance establishing a code of ethics and establish penalties for a violation of this code. Uh, that co code, uh, there was a code of ethics that was established and that is contained um, within the, the uh, rules of procedure. Section 8.13 established the Ethics Review Commission Oversight Office, and that has been established uh, by the County Manager's Office. If there are no questions, we'll move on to Article 9. Should be the next, I believe it's the next slide. Thank you. So, Councilor Medvedji, this is uh, what you were talking about earlier. Um, Article 9 has to do with charter review and amendments. And the charter is reviewed periodically by a charter review commission. So that is every five years. Um, they, and the commission uh, serves its 15 member commission, three uh, from each council district. And the term of office for those elected to the commission will be two years or until the work of the commission concludes. So the commission responsibility and duty, um, they are bound by responsibility and duty to review the charter to determine its adequacy and suitability to the needs of the county and propose uh, amendments for that. So the Beyond the Charter Review Commission, um, the council can also um, recommend charter amendments and voters can also um, recommend charter amendments. For the charter amendments proposed by the council, um, they can may, may propose amendments to the charter by enacting an ordinance to submit a proposed amendment to the voters at the next November general election. So it would have to be at a November general election, not at a February election. And that proposed, the ordinance with the proposed amendment would have to be provided at least 90 days um, after enactment. A minimum of four votes is also required to enact such an ordinance. Are there any questions about that process? And certainly, um, just in talking about um, reviewing uh, the charter and making charter re 
amendments or uh, talking about that, that's also an item that can be talked uh, during a council time session. So that is all that we have on the charter. Um, are there any questions? I don't have any questions, but I do have a comment. I just want to say that, you know, the charter is an interesting thing, and I appreciate that this session is being uh, recorded so that people can r refer back to it, because I think this is a great way for the public to be able to become more comfortable with our charter. But I want to say that the, you know, Section 9 is one that I really appreciate. I, I, I always want the, the power to be the, in the hands of the people, and so any way that we can get the public more involved, I really appreciate. And so I love the fact that a charter amendment can be proposed by the public, by the council, and by the charter commission. I think it's fantastic. Thank you. And now I know that it is 10.09. Um, I believe that uh, the council should uh, take just a quick five minute break, which would take us to 10.14. And if we begin again then, uh, and deal with item five through uh, 11 o'clock, then we will have an hour for council board assignments. So um, with that provision, we are uh, to be back in session again, full speed at 1014. Thank you. Thank you. And we proceed to item five on the Agenda for the council retreat, Kathleen. Excuse me, Chair Bowerman. This is Leslie Lopez. Um, I just want to make a quick comment before we move on to the rules sure. of procedure. Um, during my presentation, I mentioned that the code of ethics was in the rules of procedure, and actually, the council uh, worked on removing that, and it is it was enacted as an ordinance and is part of the county code. And I'll just. Um, talk about which one that is. So um, County Code 2.07.020 is the code regarding the Ethics Review Commission. And then 2.07.030 is regards to the Ethics Review and Oversight Office. I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. And Chair Barman, um, with your okay, if we can uh, do item number four, which is the rules of procedure. In my mind, we had already done that. Okay. <laughs> Go right ahead, please. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. No, no worries. Uh, so I know this is posted online and I sent to council. So the yellow highlights are um, some suggested edits that I have incorporated based on how we're conducting business now or based on other dialogue that we've had with council. Um, I did highlight, I believe in green, um, or a different color regarding the number of votes that are required, which said a minimum number of three, because I know that council has had some uh, very preliminary discussions on that before, but there's no suggested edits on that. And then Chair Bowerman also provided some input over the weekend, uh, which is highlighted in blue uh, for her suggested edits. So um, if it's amendable to council, I'll go through and at least talk about the changes that are being recommended and the why, and then we can answer any questions. And if there's anything at that point as well, if you want to discuss in more detail of other potential edits, uh, that would be helpful. Does that sound okay? Kathy, okay. if the uh, council wishes to adopt some of the proposed edits, how, how would that occur? Um, I would, uh, for process wise, I'll bring back if there's changes um, or more dialogue next week, um, so if there's changes that are not incorporated all right now, we'll incorporate it or draft it for your review next week, and we'll keep doing that at council time until we're comfortable, and then that would actually go to a hearing because this is accompanied by an ordinance. So we'll take that and then we have to do our notice for the hearing, but we won't take it to the hearing until council is comfortable with the language that's being incorporated. Chair, I have a clarification question. Uh, Kathleen, did you say we could ask questions as we go along? Absolutely, okay. yes. Okay, it looks like you're already on the first page. Um, so that item um, that's highlighted there on 1B is just a capitalizing rules of procedure because it is a title. 
Um, going down to the chair, vice chair in Article 3E. So this is additional language that if a councilor vacancy occurs, the remaining councilors will vote to reappoint its members to serve on boards and commissions vacated by the councilor seat under until the seat is filled. So this is really about the boards and commissions and it had also language in here about um, filling vacant council seats, which we may have to update based on the requirement and the procedures. Um, so this is just bringing that clarity as well to make sure that we have representation on boards and commissions. So I, I always, going through something like this, I always like it in paper, but I was gonna try to tee it up on my iPad um, and I'm having trouble finding it on my iPhone, I'm wondering if Tina could at least oh. increase the font or the size of the screen in front of us. Yes, so and I know Michelle is watching, I believe as well. That, Michelle, if you can print good. a hard copy as well and bring it in uh, for Councilor Mevajit. Does anybody else need a hard copy? Okay, so um, Michelle, if you can print one as well, that would be great. Can you see that now? Yes, you need a little yes bigger? this is perfect, thank okay. you. So. <laughs> I did have one question about that. Do you, of course. Is this a good time? I enter 3C. I was just curious, so this kind of changes some things, but I, and I noticed, and this could, I mean, this kind of overlays with our next, or our conversation on boards and commissions, but I did notice there was a few that were designated to be filled by the chair. Is that by the bylaws of that particular group? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. I had a comment on B. Okay. Uh, I noticed later on there's a section about excused absences, so and that it's the notifying the chair and the uh, executive, and so that might be something needed to add to the chair's responsibilities as far as excusing absences. And uh, also on B, uh, that's where that section, that line is supervise constituent response processes for the council as a whole. And so maybe we don't articulate what that process might be, but uh, I suggest we talk about that and uh, figure out that process. Thanks. If we go down to item four, which is regarding regular meetings on B, um, uh, just capitalizing the title there in B for county manager, and then um, there was an addition from the chair in the last sentence about executive sessions, if needed, generally, generally will be scheduled at the end of meetings, but may be scheduled at any other time during these meetings, if approved as an agenda change at the beginning of the meeting or as soon as the needed addition is known by the county manager and chair. Uh, and, yeah, I printed this out just before the meeting, but I didn't have any blue highlighted down at the end there. <laughs> yeah, this is what was posted and sent out, but I can... Um, so maybe I should get a copy. Yeah, Michelle, if you can print another copy, that would be... We need one more copy. When Sorry, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, moving down to item six, quorum. So this is where I just highlighted the minimum number of votes, um, which is a majority of three counselors will constitute a quorum and is the minimum number of votes. So this has been brought up when we've had vacancies on the council or if there's only three individuals there and it's a two one and so, so I have not suggested any language but um, certainly want to um, highlight that for the, or the questions before and for consideration or dialogue with council. This is Sue, I had a uh, comment um, back on five uh, and where there is an RCW, if there, if we could, and, and if it's not too long and elaborate, just kind of summarize a little bit. I'm just thinking of if this is user friendly for the public, so they're not having to.
look up all these RCWs, that would be helpful. And in this section, um, uh, maybe it's not considered a regular meeting, but uh, if work sessions need to be explained. I also have a comment on number five. And having read 42.30.080, I did not see any specification of who is able to call that meeting. I just only saw notification requirements. And so I'm wondering whether we need to include language for that as far as who would be able to call. I mean, for me, a suggestion would be two counselors or the county manager to be able to call a special meeting to order. Uh, so with these suggested edits, I, do we want to continue to move forward and then come back and have detailed discussions on these so that we can get direction from council? Is that doable or do you want to have the discussion now? I think we need to have the detailed discussion later, um, maybe a, a council time as you described so we can see the integration of the whole. Okay, um, I do, I think at the end that at least we need to have some sort of direction because I don't want, I want to make sure that I'm representing what the majority of the council wants uh, for the next iteration. I'm not, can you hear me, Madam Chair? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was actually, I was trying to push the right button here and I didn't. I was gonna say just the opposite instead of going completely through it and then trying to remember what we want to address or discuss and I, I think we as we come across issues that need further discussion and direction to the county manager for redrafting I think we should take it on now um, that would be my suggestion I, I would agree with that as well actually that makes so much sense the only problem is which where my mind had been is we won't get done with the agenda today do we care about that if we don't, then discussion of all of this as we go is certainly appropriate. We, we do have a second day set if we don't get through today's agenda for exactly that reason. But that also has its agenda. So I hear you. So are we wanting to discuss, if we're wanting to discuss five, then would you please scroll back up to it? But Chair, this is Sue, uh, uh, just to that question of who calls the meeting, I was wondering how does that happen now? Usually it's at the request of council to have a special meeting. If there's an emergency going on, then we will do it because um, all of our meetings have to be noticed with a certain time frame. So would it be a majority vote of the council to call a special meeting? See, we get into trouble with open public meeting act if it requires three to call a special meeting because otherwise you would the only time you'd be able to call one would be at a public meeting if i'm correct councillor young where you said um who is on per the rcw a special meeting may be called at any time by the presiding officer of the governing body so that to me would be the chair or the and Leslie, you're, Leslie's pulling it up so she can weigh in on this, but that would be my, or the majority. Okay, so if we were to decide that we would like to give that ability to the county manager, we'd have to add it into this language? Yes, I'm sorry, I believe so. Sure. Uh, do you want me to? Yeah, I wasn't sure what, okay. what, if you could. So I, personally, I feel like the county manager, the administrator should be able to call a special meeting as well, but I don't think it's specified in that RCW. Um, in reading the RCW, it says that it can be called at any time by the presiding officer of the governing body. And based on our rules of procedure, I would, uh, that to me appears to be uh, the chair, uh, the presiding officer of the governing body is the legislative body, which is the council, and the presiding officer would be the chair. It says, or by a majority of the members of the governing body, um, by delivering written notice personally to each member of the body. 
So if, if I am understanding correctly, then the RCW does give the authority to county manager as well as a majority of the council and the chair individually. Is that correct? Uh, that's what it states. Um, what I I would like to look into this because I, my understanding we have had special meetings, um, but. I believe that those decisions have been done in an open meeting. So in other words, mm -hmm. it was a vote taken by the council, not outside of a meeting to decide um, to have a special meeting. And sometimes those special meetings have occurred if um, there was something that needed to be done fairly quickly. And so um, we needed to have a special meeting um, to accomplish that. And, and so I would agree that I think there are a number of related issues that are complicated that are going to take a little bit of uh, time for you to sort through this. I think the county manager typically it was, you know, she's the one in the position to say, hey, we need a declaration of emergency. We need it or and that can be done without a meeting at all uh, just by going to the chair. Uh, so uh, the chair should have this authority. But it gets to the other related issue and, and some of the rules kind of reflect prior discussion. You know, to some extent, the chair uh, in the past, as we sort through the new charter, you know, we were looking for um, the chair to have a little bit more responsibility and control uh, of the agenda. You know, what would be brought up on the fly or at a special meeting or at a regular meeting? Um, and so that got the discussion of, well, does it take one counselor plus another? Does it take three counselors? Does a chair just decide? I mean, kind of looking at the parallel on a legislative body at, in Congress uh, or the control of, of committees uh, in our state legislatures around the, on the nation. So all these are kind of related issues, um, kind of defining when, what the authority roles and mission is of the, of the chair. Uh, as well as the county manager. So, but I, I do agree the chair, as well as the county manager, should be able to call a special uh, meeting. This is Sue. Uh, it just sounds as though we've got it covered, you know, currently with the current language. So I'm satisfied with that. And any clarification that might come forward later would be fine as well. But I'm I'm good. I agree. Uh, so if I'm hearing correctly that you're good with the current language and following the RCW. Okay. Um, is anybody else have any, I heard three that were good with that. Yeah, I'm good with that. Right. Look for majority. Language, okay. you're referring to the way it is, uh, uh, amended here on the proposal. Correct. Um, I don't believe that there would be any changes. Um, to section five of the rules of procedure, because we'll just be following the RCW and continue as we have. So all that part that's crossed out remains crossed out. Gotcha. Yeah. Any other discussion or questions on this one? Um, just one last thing, and, and you know, being new on the council, I don't know exactly when a special meeting would be called. So I don't know kind of the background behind when when would happen, um, but it, it, so. If we leave it as it is, that means that the the uh, chair can call a special meeting, and the county manager can call a special meeting, or three on the council. But we would have to be at a public meeting in order to do that. Are there any instances where you would need to? So we have had that come up when we were under a time crunch and we were considering a change, and we're sitting here and we go, you know, we need to. One, get, meet the public notice requirements. Mm -hmm. Two, we have to meet the Columbia news requirements, which are different. Uh, and so we did vote in an open public meeting. Uh, other than that, I don't remember any other special okay. Yeah, the majority of the special meetings are discussed with council in a public meeting. Um, and I wasn't involved with the special meeting, but an example of one that may not have happened at a council meeting was if, I don't know, three, four years ago. There was a budget issue at the end of the year that we had to have a special meeting on New Year's Eve because we had to get something done by the first. Mm -hmm. So that was not discussed in a public meeting to set that meeting, but it was brought to the county manager's attention at that time 
that we're out of compliance and we need to get this fixed. Okay. Um, so it is, it's rare that we have to, because like Councilor Mavaji alluded to, even with emergency declarations, the chair or absent the chair, the vice chair can approve it by phone with me. And then we do that. And then at the next regular scheduled meeting, the full council then adopts and considers it. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, so item six, the quorum, uh, did we want to talk about the minimum number of three votes here? Because um, I know there was prior discussion with counselors regarding, you know, if, there, if a majority of who's present versus a minimum of three based on vacancies. No? Well, uh, later on, I will have once again revisit the idea of a 2 1 vote, 2 2 vote. Okay. But uh, obviously, we're not even having a meeting if we don't have three uh, to show up. So, okay. anyway, we'll take. Okay. Um, okay, so then item, is there anything else? So item seven is the next one. And this one includes uh, some language that the chair had added about the agendas will be provided for the following order of business and will be posted online um, by a specific date and time. We have not established that yet um, on the pre such as by 5 p.m. on the preceding Wednesday. The time of the meeting shall be posted with the agenda in all locations it appears online. Chair, this is Sue. I would just like to wholeheartedly support this. I think uh, from the public's perspective, having a few days to prepare, because uh, that could mean you need some business days to contact people to find out more information. So I, I think this is, uh, this is wonderful. Uh, and um, I, if, if this is something we adopt, I think there's other places in uh, the procedures where we'll need to update it. Is Wednesday a good um, day? That sounds reasonable. Okay. Is that doable for the staff? That's exactly what I was going to ask. Well, we've been a little lax over the last two years. Um, they're supposed, there's a schedule when they're supposed to have things upstairs. So if we're following that schedule, yes, this will be fine. Great. Because they need to have things turned in the week before. So we've Excellent. already communicated out to our leadership team of like we need to do, and I'm already, I've already kicked somebody off of an agenda because they turned it in too late. Unless it's an emergency, and if it's an emergency that like we found out there's a, we have to have council approval to apply for a grant and the deadline is past this time frame, then we will ask the council to amend the agenda. So. My thinking here is that more. if it were posted by 5 p.m. the preceding Wednesday, and even Wednesday night, both counselors and the public could consult what the, the content of that is. So that would be so helpful. Yes, I absolutely support this as long as it's something that staff is able to reasonably achieve. Um, one other request that goes right along with this is could we include the slides as part of the meeting documentation? I thought we'd do, they're linked on the agenda. I think there's like the, there could be the staff, it's usually one link and it has a staff report, a resolution if that's what the council is considering and then the um, presentation, it's all in one link. Okay, like I did not, maybe I'm looking in the correct place but I did not see, oh, not this one, sorry, but there have been a couple presentations that I have not found so maybe I'll work with you. And and. Not everybody creates a PowerPoint presentation. If it's um, if it makes sense, there's some that you know they just talk to the staff report, so there may not be presentations that are shared. Okay. A related question is: Can the slides be produced that far ahead? Because even though now they are maybe linked at the time of the posting, the posting is often much later. I would say yes, because if they're if they're some when they submit their stuff, they are submitting everything in its entirety. So if, right. yeah, so if we're getting that, and if it's not, if they don't have it, we won't add it, um, you know, so we can, we'll work with staff on that. I, I just want to add a quick comment that, if I may, the, um, you know, we, we always get criticism when we change the meeting time from the morning to the afternoon or from the afternoon to the morning. We always get criticism <clears throat> when there's late notice or late posting of links. Um, 
but I want to assure the public there's no <clears throat> reason behind it other than well, we experience a pandemic and a lot of disarray on how to have these hybrid meetings. Uh, we are doing the best we can to get the information in advance of the meeting on a set schedule. Uh, and I would say, you know, some people from the dais, some people, I'm old school. I mean, when I went to law school, every single case book I had, I read it by highlighting and then and making notes. So when I have, when we have a Tuesday meeting, when we have a, an important meeting, I like to get the material printed because, you know, some people just, you know, they want to save trees and I understand that. They'll just use their iPad and scroll through the documents. And I will do that too during a meeting. I'll have the document teed up so I don't have to rely on the screen. Uh, but I enjoy having a binder made so that I can highlight and put notes uh, in the margin to myself. It's just the process mm -hmm. I'm used to being an old guy. I'm not trying to create more work for Kristen or Michelle and creating more binders. But I, I can tell you that uh, I think Quaring and I uh, both did that. Um, you know, we, we requested binders for those important public meetings that had a lot of PowerPoint or staff report. I'm a I'm sure, right. Councilor, like that. that yeah. you will be accommodated <laughs> as usual, but I suspect that doesn't impact the verbiage here. Right. Uh, this is Sue. I just have one. Uh, comment, and I think there's still reason for people to check, though, uh, the uh, the grid because they could be late entries in terms of comments from the public or other agencies. So it's always a good idea to keep looking at that. One last thing, too. I think this may already be happening, but whenever there's an update or if anything's changed, do we get send an email? Yeah, and if. So with this process, I will not be making any updates um, online. Uh, what we're doing towards the end of, or end of last year, I believe, is if we had any updates from when it was posted to when the meeting was, we would say updated on this date. But with this process, I will not be doing that. We will make an uh, update via amendment to the agenda um, during the council meeting. I can certainly send it to you all ahead of time. As long as I get ahead of time, uh, we can forward that on, but uh, we, some constituents did not like the fact that we were updating and changing things online because they, you know. They don't have that same notification process as we would. Well, yeah, and you know, and I don't want, you know, lack of information will be created. So they're like, what are you hiding? What are you doing? And that's not the intent. The intent is to get the most current. And if there's a change, that's why we started adding updated on the state. So somebody would see that, um, but we will still send it to council, but I will not be changing the agenda or updating it until we amend it during the meeting so that we're transparent. Are there in instances where documents might change? Not often. Okay. Yeah, not often. It happens, but not often. Okay. So the only other item under A was the consent. For some reason, the um, and I don't have the full history, but the consent and was deleted, and we're currently allowing public testimony both on consent and separate business items now. So I just added that back back in. This is Sue, I have a question. Could you explain why that is? Because I think there's members of the public that are confused about that and feel compelled to show up uh, to an additional meeting uh, now that there's public comments allowed. That's not tied to OPMA, is it? Um, Councilor Marston, are you talking about uh, the Tuesday council meetings? Because I believe that public comment has, that's what we're talking about right now. Okay. And, and maybe that's in a different section. We can cross that when we get and there. We have two times where public can speak on a Tuesday meeting. One's on agenda items only and then the open. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this section? Okay. If you can scroll down. Um, our next change is on E, um, but does council have any uh, discussion on any items before that? Yes, uh, on C, I think that is, it says four calendar days, and if we go with the five, you know, the change that we made in 7A, that should be revised. Thank you. Any other discussion? Okay, on item E, 
just added the council. Um, and I believe because the charter on 8.2 says that the chair or a council, which is why we deleted the S. I thought it was, it identifies in there who we're going to look really quick. Okay, so section 8.2 of the charter is enactment of ordinances, so I don't know that that is accurate for this particular section. I believe it should state uh, section 2.2 .2 instead of 8.2. Well, doesn't 8.2 identify if somebody wants to put an ordinance on? So it says, except as provided in 8.2, a counselor seeking to put any item on a Tuesday meeting must take the item to the council chair with at least one other counselor. And I will say for Tuesday meetings, we don't usually, those aren't necessarily just for discussion, that's more of council time. So I would say that this provision actually talks more about our council time agenda because their council time, you're not necessarily formally approving things unless we can't wait until the Tuesday meeting. And Tuesday meetings are action, all of them are action items and none of them are just for discussion where that would happen at council time. We'll look, we'll look into Yeah, we'll look more. into this because I, I'm i looking at the language and I just want to be careful if it's a counselor with the support of another counselor going to the chair, that's a quorum. And so we, I'd like to look at this further before we um, add this language. So then if we go down to H, is there any items before H that council has questions? Um, okay, so in H, the, the only um, suggested edit here that it says all matters coming before county council involving county funds will be presented in compliance with the current budget guidelines and, and then I, and it said in um, including a fiscal note that I added including but not limited to because there might be different um, budget regulations that need to be taken into consideration. So I just want to make sure it's all encompassing. If I'm not hearing anything, I'll keep moving on um, in section I. Uh, no motion will be debated unless seconded. When the motion is seconded, the council chair will say so and the councilors will proceed with discussion then voting, which is the normal um, process for that. I do have a question on that one. And it's actually, I think, similar to the last one if it just came to my mind. When there are multiple items in the consent, are individuals allowed to testify three minutes if there are multiple items that they are concerned about or have comments about, or is it three minutes in com combination between all of them? I think we do. It's one person gets one three minutes to talk on any agenda items. Um, I have never seen somebody ask for six minutes to talk on two agenda items. I have done that. <laughs> Okay. So it does happen, but I'm not saying that that's the way the policy should be. Yeah. So, so I would open up to council. Um, we have not done that here before. It's three minutes. It's just like. Yeah, I wouldn't know. encourage that. Sorry, Glenn. And, and we have had some notable people come in and speak at every opportunity yep. and say the exact same thing, even though they were addressing a singular topic. Uh, you know, it can get out of control very quickly. You know, I, I like flexibility. I do. You know, if we have one person here 
And I will uh, one quick anecdote. When I was first on the RTC, there was one guy that had a public comment, and he went beyond the allotted time at the RTC, and the chair immediately cut him off. I was sitting right there, and I'm going, well, that's just rude. You know, he's an elder. Let's give him a little bit more time. You know, that, but, but once you open up the floodgate, um, it, it can be touchy. And there are other rules that touch the three-minute issue. But I think if we open it up to allow, especially when we have nine or ten on yeah. the consent agenda, man, one person can really dominate a public meeting unfairly to, to the meeting. Um, as someone who regularly, as someone who regularly uh, goes to school board meetings, I concur with Councilor Medvedge. Um, I think you can get your point across in three minutes. And as someone who's been watching the council meetings for two years, um, I'm familiar with some of the community members that show up that can uh, over overtake the time that we have. So I agree. I can see both advantages to both ways, but I'm okay with that direction. I think it's just good to have it defined so that we know in case there's the instance that comes up where somebody wants to. Yeah, and I think in the um, section L, we try to define that there um, that we'll get to here. So any other questions on I or discussion? Not hearing any. Okay, so item J, uh, Chair Bowerman provided this suggested amendment or update, which is um, when a councilor is proposing an amendment, they have the right to begin the debate on the amendment with acknowledge, when acknowledged by the chair, which is just a, a regular council decorum and how we operate. Okay, no feedback. Okay, so in public comments, you'll see a lot of highlights in here. So I was trying to make it very clear on our current practice and not only current practice, but also the new updated OPMA rules, which require us um, to allow public testimony on any agenda items in which action may be taken. So, um, so on the two, we have the Tuesday meeting on here uh, where it says, you know, there'll be during a Tuesday's council meeting, consent and separate business, um, uh, public comment period, any individual or spokesperson for a group can address the council for three minutes on any matter that is on the consent and or separate business items on the agenda. Um, and then speakers should sign in on the sheet provided um, at the meeting or raise hand via the virtual protocols. The council chair or their designee will call on each person at the appropriate time. Individuals providing public comment must state their name for the record, state the consent and or separate business agenda item for which they're speaking and may not yield their time to add to other individuals a lot of time unless approved by the majority of the council. So that language is pretty consistent with the rest of that. So that is consistent for agenda items for council time, and it's also consistent for open public comment. It just identifies that they can speak on any county business matter for up to three minutes. They need to be acknowledged. Um, we had in here, I believe like, um, in the room, I can't, oh, back at the hearing room, I deleted that out. You can see that in um, section II because we used to have our council time in room 698, which is a conference room in the back. We used to have work sessions in our training room, but since COVID happened, all of our meetings have been in here for ease of access for um, public testimony, for CBTV and everything. So, and those are limited in the other rooms. So. I just, I deleted that and it still gives flexibility if someday we, this uh, council wants to go back to the room in 698, um, as long as we still have opportunity for public to attend. It is a, there's probably eight chairs available for the public to sit in there. So it is very limited. Um, so I just didn't want to tie us down to a room in the event that that changed. Um, so I'm not going to read all the rest of these. Like I said, they're pretty um, consistent with the uh, open public comment on Tuesdays, a public hearing, um, a Wednesday's council time, um, and then um, item five on that one also includes any other meetings that may be established, whether it's a special meeting or not. This is Sue, I have a question uh, related to council time. Um, and I think that's where things change that now sometimes the council takes votes during council time when that did not happen before and therefore 
That's why public comment is allowed. Is that correct? Yes, the OPMA changed the rules, um, and so it's any time that council's taking a vote or providing direction with the majority of the council on an agenda item. So the uh, public has to have that right to comment prior to that on the agenda item. Thanks for that explanation. Mm -hmm. Right, and um, just to clarify, that typically means where final action is taking place as well. So um, that is part of though it was uh, amended by the legislature. Real quickly, back to the three minute thing. When I read this, it's not definitive. I, I think maybe we should consider adding total three minutes because when, when it says for three minutes on any matter, to me that does sound like you can do three minutes on each and every matter. On the bottom of page seven. I have no objection to what you're proposing. That does sound more clear. And on item six, um, and I, Leslie kind of pointed out a typo that I had. It says the council may increase a shape or decrease the three minutes allotted time and or total amount of time for public testimony for all persons speaking on a particular topic upon approval of the majority. So what this is referencing is if we know um, that, you know, 50 people are gonna show up we, you know, council could decide to give all 50 people three minutes to speak, or you could reduce the three minutes to two minutes, or you can say, we're gonna hear public testimony for an hour, or we're gonna hear 10 that support it and 10 that don't support it, so that there's a good representation. Um, but this just provides flexibility to the council to amend um, if you see fit that, and we will always have options to help you go through that process to determine what makes sense for you. What I intended, let me ask you if this comes clear or not, in the in the blue of all persons speaking on a particular topic, I meant if John Smith wants an hour, but everybody else gets only three minutes, that's not good. All persons would have to be granted the same amount of time. Is that clear? Does correct. that come through as the meaning? If I could just add a comment, because, you know, whether it's fireworks or dealing with the equestrian community, community or rest, high school wrestling, uh, we've had to deal with these issues. And um, I think we've done a good job of figuring it out and being fair, you know, fair, and when we've limited the amount of comment time, we've then allotted, okay, well, we're going to read into the record, you know, a portion of the hundreds of, of of public comment we received by email. Uh, we've done a good job. Where where we really need to focus, and this is really for the chair, is on enforcement of it. You know, once you start letting someone go beyond, and I'll give an example. And this wasn't uh, you, Karen. It was a, your predecessor. You know, we had very controversial uh, presentation. Um, I, for one, wanted to give. Uh, the mini initiative more time to do their presentation, but we set on, I think it was 10 minutes. We were going to let, I think it was Rob Anderson speak and, and we held him to that and he needed more time. And that, you know, that's the majority of the council, um, agreed to that 10 minute. But, uh, what then happened and I really appreciate it, and I commented on earlier, you know, we had the PA do a presentation. And the chair, it, it went on and on and on and on. And it was a complaint by uh, those other presenters. Well, we only got 10 minutes. Why did the other party get so much more time? Uh, and it really was um, <coughs> unbalanced. So that's, a, that's a, a gavel issue. You know, that's something the chair needs to be mindful of. And it wasn't you, it was the prior chair. Just let uh, one person go on. Um, when they shouldn't have. So I think we do a good job of balancing this and trying to have a good meeting and have all, uh, have transparency and all views heard. Um, and hopefully we won't have many uh, more controversies uh, in the future, but, but I expect we will. 
And it just yes. so this council knows, you know, those doors get opened in the back. The whole room gets filled, every seat, and then that other room gets filled too. And if you have everyone wants to do three minute uh, comment, we'd be here until two or three in the morning. Well, with the language that is suggested here now, the PA's office would be cut off after that 10 minute period too. And I'm not sure that they would be amenable to that, but that's what this says. Or the original presenter of the mini initiative would have been given as much time as the PA was going to have. So I don't know if that's okay with people, but that's what it says. That's actually what I was thinking was fair too. Yeah. Is there any um, suggested edits on this? So it's really the two, I think for me, the two takeaways is one, there is flexibility for the council to adjust accordingly and how you want to um, conduct public testimony. And two, it is important to be consistent because if we, you know, work sessions, we don't usually have public comments on work sessions. Um, and then we don't have open general public comments on council time. There may be times that it's appropriate and the council can make that decision, but if we're gonna do it for one, we gotta do it for all. And we would have to be prepared if you do it this meeting and not the next meeting, why? And so we need to make sure that we're just providing that clarity and consistency. I've, I've got a question real quick before we move forward. And um, I don't know if this would be a great idea. It sounds wonderful. Sometimes you have great ideas and they aren't so good, but I was curious about if if and how we could potentially involve our boards and commissions more, you know, perhaps have in, instead of, or in addition to having staff report on specific you know, issues that a board or commission has made a decision or a recommendation to bring to council, could we bring a member of the board or commission to come and be involved in the process? I think it's always something that individuals on our boards and commissions, they sometimes feel like they go through a lot of work and don't get a whole lot of, uh, they aren't necessarily heard completely. So I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. We have done that. We did it with the planning commission and I've, with the board of health, we have our newly revitalized citizen advisory committee. We're asking for them to come to the board of health to do presentations. So. Great idea, I, we need to do more of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I would love to see the planning commission, you know, especially especially the more complicated commissions and committees like DEEB and the planning commission where um, it's particularly complex issues. And I think that message can get lost between, you know, staff bringing it from the commission itself. So it's nice to have a rep from that particular commission come and, be a, a bit more of the conversation. So my my only um, caution or pause would be if you do it for one, you gotta do it for all. Mm -hmm. um, most of them like planning commission and D, they're recorded. So anybody can go back and review what is being said. Um, and I, you know, and I'm get, I'm taking on a project um, this year as well in reviewing bylaws of some of our boards and commissions. One, to make sure that they're updated, but two, are we operating within those current bylaws? Because I do know of a couple commissions that are taking on a role of advocacy uh, for personal projects that is actually, in my opinion, a conflict of interest when the bylaws are like, no, you, you will, um, provide information requested by council or by staff. It's not not supposed to be driven by the boards and commissions. So I think, you know, just resetting what is the parameters for those boards and commissions on how they're operating um, and reminding them because we, we do have some things that aren't working as well in some of our boards and commissions and we want to make sure that that we're doing that. So, uh, but we it's up to the council. I mean, you guys can always invite any boards or commission that you would like on particular topics. Um, but, you know, staff is the representative on many of the projects. They are the ones that are presenting at the planning commission. They're the ones that are presenting here. And they also have their three minutes that any member can come and provide testimony as well. Just, just a quick comment on that. I, th I think it could get a bit tricky if uh, to make sure that they're representing the full 
uh, board or commission and not just speaking as an individual or that they clarify if they're just speaking as an individual, uh, but that board or commission needs to kind of give the okay for them to speak on behalf of them. Yeah, I, I do agree with that. That is that it that would present a challenge, or you know, perhaps they can be brought in just in the event we have a question. But I'll, I hate to be, you know, asking them to make a time commitment. And they show up and nobody has a question too. So it's a kind of a tough topic. But I'm a big fan of involving them, however we possibly can. And so, and just one other thing before we move on to, you know, when. So you are getting that perspective, but their perspective may be completely different than what the community wants. And so if you're showing a preference on one versus another, that might create um, a challenge for council and the community. So, but we're here to support you and do whatever you would like. I, I want to add to that because we do it by exception. I mean, on subjects that we want to dig into and have them in the room and so we can ask questions and have an interface. Uh, you know, we kind of went through that with the buildable lands model when we had so many topics uh, that there was no agreement on or uh, there was a minority view. To me, the minority view was just as important as uh, the others that weren't able to decide. So, you know, there, by, by exception, I think there are particular times when we want to invite particular groups, uh, committees and boards to come in and do an actual presentation. What would be a process for that then? The council discusses it at council time and will somebody will make a motion to allow a specific organization or represented group to provide testimony outside of the three minutes that all others are given. And then the council will vote on that. And if the majority supports it, then we will extend the invitation. But they can certainly come. I mean, you can have 10 members of a commission and all 10 members come and they might get three minutes each person to provide that testimony as, as well. But and, it, would, it would require the majority of the council to support that change. Maybe that would be something to kind of look at when reviewing bylaws is maybe how they would elect a special representative, a specific one or something like that. But um, I mean, if it's, if it's gotta be done in council time, like a, if it's a week prior, but we don't get documents until five days before, then I don't know how we would. No, you're, you're actually gonna be getting those documents now on Wednesday. So it's um, before, you're gonna know, because any topic like that is probably going to be a hearing. So there's gonna be notice in advance of that. Okay. Fair enough, yeah. Because it's a 10 or 15 day notice for a hearing. I mean, certainly if you have a separate business or consent item, um, you'll at least see the, I guess if it's after five o'clock after the council meeting, you can start out Tuesday's meeting with asking council to consider allowing a special group to present on a separate business item or consent. Okay. Any other? feedback or discussion, no, okay. Um, the one on M, again, this is highlighting the three votes are required. Um, I don't know if there's any discussion on this now or if you want to continue on. I, I think I missed something back here on, uh, um, related to civility and persons addressing the council. Uh, I, you know, in these divided times, I think it's important to, you know, sometimes it's just startling. You hear something and you don't know how to react. But I think if we could be prepared, really, the chair or maybe even any one of us to uh, stop uh, a person when they're moving into a territory, you know, and, and I think uh, particularly um, any kind of attacks to staff or their professionalism and things like that. Uh, I think uh, I've, I've seen it work very well when that is just cut off really very quickly and then others that follow don't continue along that line and it makes it for less of a hostile kind of environment for other people who want to testify on, on things. So I think just to encourage us all to uh, try and stop that behavior when it starts to happen. 
I, I would encourage us to have that be the responsibility of the chair because it is designated in the chair's duties that uh, having the decorum of the uh, council meeting is up to the chair. And I would find it a little bit um, confusing uh, if I were the person testifying and two or three people entered into a discussion about my language or whatever. I just, I, I just think that needs to be a focus of responsibility for the chair. And then it's clear. And, you know, you're not going to elect a chair who doesn't speak up, right? <laughs> so I, I want to just add, we need a little bit of flexibility because there have been, and we lived through this, especially three, four years ago, um, some instances where the public really were saying very inappropriate things. And you get into the First Amendment and you get um, cautioned by the PA that, well, you have to allow them to speak. Uh, but the issue I want to address is this. You know, sometimes, um, especially because of a hybrid and remote, uh, you're not seeing what we're seeing here. Uh, sometimes um, we need people to speak up, especially if they're comments against the chair, and we had the unfortunate experience for a period of time where you'd get negative public comment that was really inappropriate, directed towards the chair, and then we had two two counselors that were cheerleading uh, that dissent out in the public. It really created a very uncollegial uh, atmosphere here. So I would just say it is absolutely the chair responsibility. Uh, but there may be occasions because, uh, especially in the hybrid situation, uh, where you're not seeing or hearing, uh, especially we get comments out from the back of the room, you know, kind of hecklers. You know, you may not hear that uh, remotely, but we're hearing it up here. And I think it's incumbent upon each of us uh, to step in in appropriate times. I think that would be rare. It's always rare. Um, but uh, you have the, the gavel and the responsibility. I'm just suggesting that if one of us sees something happening, it's kind of like being on a range and anyone can, can call ceasefire. You know, I think that's uh, the best thing to do. Gary, I'm Thank sorry, Councilor Medvigi. As vice chair, I would have no problem with you doing that. However, I just would hate to see it be something that extends throughout the council. I just think that could be a confusing process and uh, probably not good. Uh, I, I would have no problem with the vice chair stepping in. I got to tell you. Thank, thank you for those clarifications. Uh, I, I just as long as as, as someone does it, uh, it, 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 not everybody has to do it, but as long as it happens is the important thing. And we've had those situations uh, this year, as a matter of fact, and and uh, they were short circuited. So it's important. Agreed. For perhaps we could use some form of language because uh, I think there should only be one person driving the ship. But in these circumstances, when the person driving the ship is not in person and can't view the meeting directly, perhaps in that particular instance, it allows a vice chair to step in. Yeah, however, that's what I just said I think I agree with that. And you know, <laughs> being remote is really not that much of a disadvantage in that we can sometimes see things that those in person perhaps don't see. So it it works both ways there, but I agree. I have no problem with the, the vice chair stepping in. Chair, this is Leslie Lopez. Um, I also just wanna make clear to the council, I think um, Councilor Medvedi alluded to this. Um, we do have to be careful about um, when uh, you know people are talked to about their public comment, it can't be just because they're, um, you know, voicing an opinion that's contrary. Um, it has to the what the law says is that it ha actually has to be a disruption to the meeting. And so I don't know if it would be maybe helpful. I can look at some language to add to this particular paragraph and bring that back to the council. Well, that could happen. I think that would be helpful. You have guided the chair very well in that regard. So either way, I suppose. 
But the idea is not to put the language in here that authorizes the entire council to handle that stuff. It, it It's too much. Yeah, and the last, yeah, and the last sentence does identify the chair may ask any person making such statements or remarks. So I can add or vice chair or designee or something so we can have that clarity. And most of this paragraph here too is talking about staff, not necessarily council. So it's about, you know, making um, comments that are vulgar, profane, defamatory about county staff. So, I mean, you, you are going to get um, individuals in the community that don't like a decision you're making, like Leslie said, and they may express that with a little, um, a little louder than normal, you know, but that, that's not making personal attacks on, on staff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nothing else on that one. On O there is just adding again, so this is council time agenda. So historically we, um, those are, have been posted on a Monday morning uh, for the Tuesday morning. Uh, we have already communicated with staff to get it to us earlier, or we post it Tuesday morning for a Wednesday morning meeting. Uh, we've been asking staff to get it ahead of time now as well, um, the week before. And sometimes that one, and, and I'm fine doing it. Um, oh, this one actually does say that, posted online by Tuesday at nine, which we do now, because we have to have a 24 hour posting on that. It does, this one I think we, uh, we potentially want to create a little flexibility. And even if we want to do it the, you know, the Tuesday morning, we can continue to do that, or we could do it the Friday or Thursday before, but sometimes discussions in our one-on-ones might drive an agenda item because uh, they are more informal just to get in front of council and listen to that. So that's where the, the some of the flexibility is um, appreciated, but we can certainly amend any agenda. Well, Tuesday at nine doesn't make a change for the better. So if if council would like to see it bounced back to a Friday uh, or a Thursday, I think that'd be great. Probably Friday is more realistic. This, I would be supportive of that. I think the more notice, the better, but understanding that sometimes there'll be something that comes up that needs to be addressed. And if I may, I think in this general area of, was the place that I kind of targeted where I thought we could make some change on the two to one, two to two situation, um, you know, under what's now going to be labeled, I think, N, uh, council rules may be suspended by a motion for a particular purpose. I didn't know that was already in there because that would have solved some issues in past votes. Uh, it will happen where we have a quorum, where we have three people. It will happen where we have four people. And uh, sometimes it just happens. And sometimes the chair doesn't know uh, because a counselor has just taken off for a vacation or or gone to business without notifying the manager or the chair, and then all of a sudden we don't have a quorum. But when we don't have a quorum, we don't have a meeting. But when we have a meeting and we only have less than the council, it causes a problem. And Robert's Rules does not address this adequately for a five-person legislative body. I brought this up before. It's a simple solution. I see no downside. And that would be if you have a two-to-one vote in favor of something, it doesn't pass. And we've had the confusion with uh, the public. Um, I'm trying to, I think it was the, um, the mining overlay that where that occurred, where the public then thought, okay, well, it failed because that was the language used. And now you're trying to undo something that failed when it didn't fail, it succeeded, but it didn't me measure up to three votes ne needed for the charter. So in the circumstance where we have a two to one vote, nothing's voted on, nothing changes, nothing's approved, nothing's happened, we should be able to reconsider that vote when we have uh, more on the council. <laughs> it could be the very next meeting. It could be all five. It could be just adding another counselor. We should be able to reconsider that and anybody should be able to reconsider a vote that did not pass. There's a difference from not passing and failing. 
Uh, the other circumstances, you have four people. So then you have a 2-2 tie. Doesn't pass, doesn't fail, but nothing happens. That should be reconsidered by the council for efficiency in government. Okay, well, we didn't have enough people to, to comply with, with the charter. Let's reconsider that vote. So that's, that change, I think, has no downside and I think could fit here as a subpart of, of N. Uh, the other consideration that I would throw out there is if we've taken, and, uh, and I'll give an example, um, fireworks. You know, we had a vote for fireworks and, and we had a ridiculous situation where um, it was voted on and then immediately there was a referendum filed. And then it was reconsidered and voted on the first referendum still pending. That was considered a new vote and another referendum was filed. So then we had dueling referendums and the reality was the law, the code that was, to, that was reconsidered hadn't taken effect. It was going to be out in the future. And it's a quirk with fireworks in the state law. But that was an example where, you know, you should be able to reconsider a vote by the entire council where nothing has, where the code is not effective yet, where it isn't an accomplished task. Um, and that may be difficult to describe, but I think it is describable. Um, so I would propose those as two changes. The first one I'm, I really think is not controversial at all. A two to one vote or two to a tie can be reconsidered on motion of any, any council member uh, at the very next board meeting uh, be, before anything becomes an, a fait accompli, if you will. And then the second portion of that, that should take some debate if anyone's in favor of it is, when can we reconsider a vote that has not yet taken effect? Because counselors do change and, and sometimes people, uh, you know, miss meetings for legitimate reasons, but wanted to have a vote on something and, and their discussion points may be really valuable. And I've had that happen where I changed my vote from the dais based on, and, I, and it, was, uh, it was on marijuana. Uh, when we first were voting on marijuana, Temple Lent said something, uh, and then I said, oh my gosh, that's, that's true and correct, I'm changing my vote. And, and so I voted a different way than I was otherwise indicating. So every counselor's thoughts and inputs and, and public statements uh, are very valuable. And, and this one situation is just, I think, intolerable and easy fix where we just, because we didn't have enough people on the dais to complete uh, a vote that we, and Robert's rules really didn't address it adequately, we had to just let it drop and let it languish. Um, anyway, that, so I, I, I am recommending that we address at least the first situation. And if you want to talk about reconsideration, I think that's a, a more, complicated subject. So Councillor Mevaji, just a quick question. I think I heard you correctly. On the 2-1, you're not proposing it to be the majority of council who is present. You're asking that if it's a two, keep the, that you have to have three votes to pass anything, but it can be reconsidered. Click your button. Click your button. I think, I think it's in the charter, is it not, that requires three votes to accomplish anything. I'm not proposing that we change that to okay. put it to a okay. public vote. I'm just saying, okay, when we don't have three votes, we should be able to reconsider it with a full council at some later time, as long as it's not a fait accompli, whatever didn't occur. Or... Can I make a comment real quick? To me, this is more an issue of attendance. You know, we're going to be addressing this here in a few minutes, but I, I feel that us as elected officials, there should be very few times that we miss meetings. I really feel that. There are a few, you know, warranted times, and we all have our personal lives that we need to attend to, but we accepted this job, and we should be in this seat on almost every occasion so that these kinds of events don't ever happen. 
That's wishful thinking, and I appreciate that thought, but we experienced it in great measure over the last couple of years where two counselors in particular did not attend and wouldn't give the chair, either this chair or the prior chair, notice, and often didn't contact the county manager, and they'd be gone for weeks. This is Leslie. Um, so uh, thank you, Councilor Medvedji, for that. Um, I guess I would need to hear from the council, if a majority of the council wants me to uh, look into that, I can um, uh, do some research and propose some language and get back to the council. But I just wanted to make sure that we had um, a majority that would like me to do that. To, to look into what, I'm sorry. To look into what Councilor Medvedji is proposing. Which part of it? <laughs> I guess all of it. So the first part, my understanding is that um, for any time that there's a two to one or a two to two vote and um, something doesn't pass, that the council would uh, then at a later time, um, someone would bring a motion to reconsider. That's my understanding of the first item. And then the second item is, my understanding is that when can the council reconsider a vote when, I'm sorry, I didn't write it down correctly. It's a reconsideration uh, before uh, the code is in, in effect or whatever we had voted on previously. If there had been an absence of counselors, you know, if it, so it's a, it's a separate topic really than the two to one and the one and, and the two to two tie. Okay. It's pretty rare, but it did occur, unfortunately, and, and it's such so simple to fix. That's, so I'd really <clears throat> urge you to, to support change, making that change. The reconsideration, I think, will take a little bit of research as to how that can be put into uh, place. And obviously, Robert's Rules does cover that. Um, if you drill down into Robert's Rules, you'll find some uh, circumstances where reconsideration process can be made. The typical one is where someone in the majority changes their mind because of something subsequent they learned. They said, you know, I, I want to I reconsider this, and I was in the majority that passed this. I mean, Robert's Rules covers that. But when you've had three members or four and not five, um, you, you may have the absence of one or two people that say, hey, you know, I wasn't there. Let's reconsider this because it's not yet in effect. This, this is Sue. Um, the, the reconsideration seems very complicated to me. And, um, you know, related to that one issue, I think it was the mining, and there was, I, I believe there was a time where that change could be made and then it was reconsidering after a window was open to make that change. I don't know, I think it's more complicated <laughs> than I than I understand, but I'd be I'd be concerned about that and as I understand what you've talked about, it it will always take 3 votes to pass anything as long as we're clear on that. Um but I I'd like I'm I'm a little bit wary about the reconsideration and I would like more information about it and maybe some clarification related to that specific case uh, related to the mining decision and Councilor, maybe I wonder, I'm posing this as a question. In Robert's rules, there's a difference between reconsider and rescind. Reconsider refers typically to uh, reconsideration of a vote that was taken at that same meeting. Are you suggesting, and this is my question, that reconsideration could be taken at any time later if the vote were 2-2 um, two, two or 2-1? Two, is that what you're suggesting? So by illustration, we actually, and it wasn't this PA, but we had another one. We had that 2-1 to one vote. The two in the majority, it was from the dais ruled that, well, Robert's rules doesn't allow you to reconsider because you lost, even though you were in the majority. A ridiculous result, contrary to common sense. So it, it just, 
just focusing on the two to one or two to two vote, nothing because we had an absence of members of counselors, it could be resolved at the very next vote. If we just put a rule in place that says, okay, well, it didn't pass because you didn't get the three votes because you had a lack of membership. I mean, the same thing could come up if you had uh, four member or five members here and two abstained, and then you had a two to one vote. And then the two that abstained realize, oh, I didn't have to abstain. They learned something subsequent. I really want to reconsider that vote and have a vote. I mean, there's a number of ways that this could happen, but a two to one vote and a two to two tie should not be a finality. That's the whole goal of changing this, filling in the gap in Robert's rules. So my question remains the same. I think you are suggesting, is this correct, that the, the uh, expression of what in, can be reconsidered in Robert's rules be expanded in our rules? Sorry, I didn't understand what well, the question is. Well, it's clear in Robert's rules that uh, what can be rescinded and what can be reconsidered. What can be reconsidered is stuff that was done at the same meeting, as you said earlier, when a counselor, ah, all of a sudden learns new information or whatever and wants to change his or her vote. But I think you are suggesting that we go beyond that and expand the time horizon during which reconsideration could be done so that it could be done whenever there has been a 2-2 or a 2-1 vote. Is that correct? No, <laughs> I'm sorry. You're making no. this much more complicated. Uh, Robert's rule addresses your, rescission your and reconsideration differently. I'm talking about the circumstance where Robert's rule doesn't cover it because our charter requires three votes, which I'm not objecting to. I think that's a good charter rule. There's nothing that happens after a two to one vote or a two to two tie. That's the only situation I'm talking about with my first suggestion. If you're talking about the second for reconsideration, that's gonna take some research and it is different from rescission under Robert's rule. Reconsideration is just treated differently. Uh, and these are gaps because we don't, even if you look at Robert, most Robert's rules won't even get into this level of detail, but it's certainly not in our charter and it's certainly not in our rules of procedure. So we've had some dead end votes with nothing happening. I think we can fix it. I am sure you're on to something very good. I don't, I just don't understand what it is that you're saying. I am so sorry. I, I do agree. I, I think we should have three votes. I mean, five is uh, three, three people in this entire community making big, big decisions. So I, I'm supportive of requiring three and having some mechanism for producing that. If you understand, I'm not suggesting we change that. Right. Yeah. The county yeah. manager was just Yes, I have that question. Uh, it has nothing to do with it. We're not going to change the three votes. That's the charter. It's good. Forget that. What I'm talking about is when we're sitting up here and there's three of us and there's a two to one vote and nothing happens. So the current. There's four of us and two to two tie and nothing happens. That's what I'm suggesting. So how's, how's it been handled in the past? No, nothing happens. Nothing, <laughs> nothing happens. happens. Right, because there's no, there's. Th there's a lack of three votes, so therefore there's no action and no moving forward. It just stops. Uh, it, it failed. In those circumstances, the measure, whatever it is, fails. So we just need a mechanism to bring it up at the next meeting where we have more counselors yeah. in participation. This is Leslie. And just, um, you know, I appreciate the um, council's discussion on this. Um, I would just be careful on assuming that um, there can be a specific thing. I, I would need to conduct research on a particular issue. So, um, but again, I would need a, you know, I just need a quorum of the council to let me know if that's what it is you want me to do. So, I, I guess I would send the question back to the chair. I don't know that we have three votes to move this forward or not. 
I see no downside. Madam Chair, what's the I, downside? I hear you. I, I if, see if no we, downside if I understood it. <laughs> and I, I don't see that you're proposing something differently than what I had asked about. That we simply okay, expand so, the basis for reconsideration. Okay, so do you support putting in an amendment for a two to one and two to two tie vote? That it be expanded if I could qualify. for reconsideration at the following or at a subsequent meeting where there are, uh, let's say, five counselors present. And Chair, um, exactly. just to clarify, my understanding is that it would include um, the PA's office, myself, um, conducting research on this issue and then bringing that back to the council. And it would be worded somehow here that is subject to discussion anyway. So, yes, I, I certainly support that, Councilor Medvigy. Councilor Medjergy, I support that, and I support the PA doing some research on that. Thank you. Yep. I, I would agree to the research only. <laughs> I, I agree to both. I think they need a two-minute break before we move on. We do. Okay, so Chair, if we can take a quick pause um, so that we can do other things <laughs> okay very good and while we're on that break um Kathleen, i you had suggested that we terminate this uh discussion at noon are you still of that mind that's up to council um i'm i'm here all day so we are at um at your will, but you know that that was what I suggested the noon, just because I know it can get tiring to be in all day. But we're more than happy to continue whatever council would okay, like. If I could interrupt here really quickly, I think we're not recording, or did we go back to recording? Okay, thank you. So I'm I'm happy to take a short break and continue. I think we can complete today. It's just a matter of getting through, you know, all the board assignments. Really, I think that. We have another, there is quickly. another presentation on the OPMA ethics and rules or okay. OPMA ethics in the Public uh, Disclosure Act. Um, if the council likes, we can talk about it depending on, uh, we can maybe do one or the other next week. Okay, let's talk about that when we get back after your two minute break, 1137. So, and so I'm going to put out a, a uh, proposed agenda for the county manager and the counselors to knock down so that we can come up with what is right. Um, we are in the middle of item four, the overview and updates on rules of procedure. I would uh, say, how about if we move item five, which is on open meetings and all of that to January 18 and uh, move immediately to council board assignments because many of those groups are beginning are, are meeting now and are looking forward to a council representative. And as soon as that were was concluded, that we conclude for the day. And who knows what time it would be. I know that the county manager had kindly suggested that we quit at noon today because there is a tendency for us to experience fatigue. This would probably allow some fatigue and so be it because we would continue until we were finished with the board assignments. So that that is a proposal. Knock it down or adopt it. I guess uh, we had counselors missing at the time too. Chair, would you care to repeat that? No, I don't actually. They were uh, late. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Anyone I'm who is for, here and present? For, County Manager? 
As I say, for what it's worth, I'm supportive of moving item number five to next week and continuing on with this discussion and the council board assignment. Is anyone else who was here supportive of that? I support that as well. I would support because, that. Okay, that's three of us. So here's what we will do. We'll finish what we're doing now. We'll move to council board assignments. On January 18, we'll include in that agenda the Open Public Meetings Act, Ethics and Public Records Act. And we will continue with that proposal until we are finished today. Off we go, correct? Okay, so uh, we will move on to the work session, the only change on there was the um, capitalizing county managers. The next section is uh, on 11, unless there's uh, discussion. I had a comment on work session just because there was some uh, confusion, I think, or maybe there's some inconsistency about when we allow uh, public testimony at work session. So I don't know if you want to clarify that here. I think uh, as much as we can be consistent. Uh, I think historically it's been no public comment um, and uh, I could see occasionally the need if invited for some technical information, having some, uh, someone come and give us some additional information, but uh, I, would, I, I would guess recommend not having public uh, comment during the work session just to be consistent. I agree with you on that, uh, Counselor, and it was my bad that at a recent work session, um, and I've forgotten the reason why the first person, oh, it was uh, he, he couldn't figure out when he was allowed to testify. And so he was there to testify, and it just seemed like a real uh, imposition on him not to allow him. But then it turned out that there were, what, five or so people who wanted to testify. And that was an awkwardness that, frankly, I had not anticipated. <laughs> so um, we could, in the future, certainly just tell some, and we've never had anyone who said, I'm confused about when I can testify. But if we had something like that, again, the chair can simply say, I'm sorry. The procedure is pretty clear, and here it is, and come back another day or whatever. But um I, I don't know, maybe we should make it to where the council could um, change the agenda on that. Because if, if it's really awkward to say no to people that they can't testify at a work session that's happened once like that, that I recall, um, maybe we should be able to amend. I, I'm just posing that as a question. So if I may, it's never been awkward before. Uh, we just haven't allowed it unless there's a law change that requires that we have public comment. And we've had it, uh, these meetings in different smaller venues in the past where, I mean, it, what, there wasn't even room for people to come in and even sit down uh, for us to cut, conduct our work. Uh, so I, I agree with what Sue Marshall said initially. Uh, let's just stick to what we've done forever. That is not a know. problem. Okay. I'm happy does to council, do that. Does council wish um, for me to add this under the public comment and call it out specifically that work se there is no public comment permitted at work sessions unless approved by the council? Or do we just keep it as is? I'm hearing as is. But I do think that that clarification to the public is helpful. There I, I would agree with that. To state, I, I would agree with that, and uh, I, I would though just like to clarify. I think it's very important for the public to tune in to the work sessions because that's where the council really deliberates, and you get an opportunity to hear why people are feeling the way they are, might lean one way or the other. So I think it's very important for people to observe, but I think it's also important for us to to have that deliberation time amongst ourselves. I personally think it should be one way or the other. 
I think any kind of process to allow for an exception is going to be very clunky. Personally, I, I, I don't know how much attendance and interest we generally have at workshops, but to me, workshops are the, the, the time that you're like gathering the most information and typically you are fairly close to a decision when you return in a decision-making capacity and, and I would be open to the possibility of allowing public comment during workshops. But just to clarify, are you suggesting that we just take out the language unless the council decides otherwise? That yeah, I, I think any process to, you know, determine whether during this workshop we allow somebody or not to, I think it's going to get too messy. So I would agree with that because we just discussed special meetings. If we need to do something special, we could set up a special meeting that would help public comment uh, if, if the circumstances required it. So I would be okay with deleting the language and just keep it as it's always been, just a work session for us. I'm good with that. So they're just saying that there's no, I don't think there's language to delete, but I can certainly add language, just calling it out that work sessions, um, that no public comment is permitted at work sessions unless approved by the council. So I can add that piece just for clarity, but it doesn't say now that they have the ability to do it. That, that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, uh, next is on 11. Is there anything before 11 that council? I, I was curious on, on Okay, I'm sorry, we, I didn't realize we had advanced past O, but is there any form of a deadline that applies to O? I wrote down Friday. You wrote down Friday. Okay, thank you. And like I said, I'll take all of this and come back next week with um, the changes to make sure it accurately reflects the council's wishes. <clears throat> okay, so on the legal, it was changing it from legal options to opinions. I had the wrong word there. I have a quick uh, correction under minutes, uh, written minutes much, I think it should be must. Yes. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, on legal opinions, uh, is there also an instance where if there's an emergency circumstance, the prosecuting attorney can offer an opinion uh, that wouldn't require three votes? I can I can ask legal to do opinions as well, the county manager and the chair. That's accurate, yes. And, and I will just add, there's been some confusion on my part over the years because we do ask the PA all the time a legal question and then they answer. So what we're really talking about is research, memorandums, you know, really doing analysis and putting some effort into a particular topic. That requires three votes, but just kind of random legal questions on the fly get answered all the time by different members of the PA's office without a vote of three people to ask the question. Thank you, Councilor Madovici. Typically, that, that is correct. Typically, if there is a question regarding process or you know something of that nature, um, any counselor can contact me to talk about that if it requires as you say, you know, analysis and research, and uh, that would require the three votes or the chair or the county manager. Um, I would say that, you know, just a, a point for me or um, anyone else from the PA's office is that sometimes there are questions that are done on the fly, you know, during a meeting um, where I will often say you know, will need to research that and get back to you. So not all questions that are presented during a council meeting will be discussed at that time because some of that um, will be attorney-client privileged and not um, just on the fly. So just wanted to point that out. Okay, uh, moving down to item 13. I just added, this is um, about the boards and commissions and task force but, uh, provided by state law and I just added in the Clark County Charter because that also identifies 
Love that. Any other uh, questions or suggestions on that page? Just a timing clarification. So in A, it's mentioned that we as a council have 30 days to confirm or reject an appointment, but there's no time displayed on when we get the detailed information about the individuals. And I don't necessarily think that that's been a problem, so I don't even know, does that need to be added or not? I don't think so. Okay. Because um, as soon as I give the okay to staff, we're, it's on the next agenda. And sometimes I sit on it because I'm asking for additional information myself, but um, so I don't, um, because this is about when it gets on your agenda that if it's not approved by council after 30 days, but we'll put it on right after I recommend it. Okay. Okay, uh, county operations. I just, so this is about um, opening and closing hours for our building here, um, otherwise uh, set. So the Clark, Clark County Code 2.0, Point oh zero one actually does have language in there about adjusting that uh, the hours um, approved by the county manager for the county departments or elected officials. Um, and so you know, this has happened with COVID and having that flexibility, um, it happens with weather sometimes. Some of the elected officials close on Fridays or you know for certain things so that they can actually get some work done. So I just wanted to reference code in there so that council and the public is aware. Uh, the next one down is on E, and please stop me if you have other edits before. Um, I would also put in here about the, so this is regarding the council will discuss and take final action on salary wages and other conditions of employment as identified in the Clark County Charter in an open public meeting. And actually, I think all decisions have to happen in a public meeting. I'm thinking about that. Yes, that's accurate. I apologize. I've got a really fast question about A. Is, oh, which is, letter are you on? Uh, 14A. Okay, thank you. Is there a financial burden to the county in the event that we were to come in the building after 5 p.m.? Is there staff or security or anything that has to maintain it? Well, um, we... The, the security already has their hours. They do. If we have a nighttime meeting, which you do one Tuesday a month, we have security that's here through that. Otherwise, they're not here at night. Okay. So um, individual counselors or staff can certainly come in after hours if they choose um, to do work. But, but there's no additional financial burden to the county in that event? The only way it would be is if it's an hourly employee and we're having to pay overtime for them to be here. Okay. Any other questions? That uh, is an interesting thought though. When council members or somebody else elected comes in and uses the facility after hours, is there a requirement that anybody else from the county staff be here then that does add to the council? No, Not no, nobody. no. It's just lights if and somebody the Yeah, so if somebody yeah. has access um, they can come into their offices at any time. The only time we would have to approve and it would occur costs is if there is a board or commission or a community group that wants to use our building after hours, then we do have to have staff here and um, ensure that, you know, until they leave. But, you know, anybody who already works in this building can come in at any time. Thank you. Okay, next one, county budget on C. Um, I also just put in there pursuant to Washington state law because there is provisions um, in state law to say when we have to have a budget approved, which I think is the first week of December. Any other questions, comments on this section? The only comment I would make is that we, this is, and I know this is probably the most difficult thing for staff to get ready, but this is probably the most critical time to make sure that we hit those deadlines for getting that information to us in advance. Yeah, there's plenty of opportunity because we will have a work session on the whole budget and you'll have all the um, 
information that departments and offices are requesting and we'll go over the proposed changes in a work session. Yeah, there, there will be plenty of opportunities to be involved um, with our budget process. It starts in the early summer. And so it's, it's a very lengthy process. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Um, any question on the vacancy and county manager section? We don't have any suggested edits on that. Councilor expenses. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question related to councilor expenses. And uh, this uh, kind of prologue here that talks about uh, reimbursing expenses for travel outside a 50 mile radius. Does the ABC, everything below that, refer to things beyond 50 miles? Or I guess what I'm wondering, will I get reimbursed uh, if I go out to Amboy to swear a couple people in? One thing, you know, and I'll talk to the auditor's office because this is um, the reimbursement is under policy, is under their purview to see um, if there's flexibility in the council changing that and determining that. I will say our budget's pretty limited in general, um, but if I can, let me follow up with Mark Gassaway and his team and bring it back next week. But I guess my question is uh, any travel that we do as counselors is, is on our own dime. Yeah, within a certain range because there is a mileage, you already have a mileage per diem that you get. Uh, well, we can, these are probably benefits or some personnel decisions that are made. I don't know that it comes up here. So if I could chime in, because this is something I painfully learned, we get a car allowance. Yes. And it's pretty robust. It's seven, I say painfully I think it's $700 because per month. When I was onboarded, no one told me about it and I didn't get it for, a, for a, almost two years. Well, so on the work time, you make sure you get that. You know, what, what this is really talking about is if you're gonna participate in NACO, NACO conference and go somewhere or whoever takes on uh, the legislative steering committee or, you know, you're heading up to Olympia to testify you know, that's outside the county. Um, there are some boards that are regional that, some, that used to require travel. Now with a hybrid environment, you don't have to do those two hour drives for the Lower Columbia and Fish Recovery Board for some, something. But there is a pretty robust uh, travel uh, allowance that you get automatically without seeking reimbursement for, for you know, travel within the county within your districts. I have an additional question about this one. And um, in December, I attended an MRSC conference and we kind of had this discussion. And, you know, in, in exhibit one coming down at the end of this here, it, it talks about that our in our conduct, we should seek to continue to advance our knowledge as council members and uh, when there are training events available, such as an MRSC training that costs 40 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever it is. Uh, and, and from our further earlier discussion with the charter, it apparently has something to do, there's a connection with the auditor, but I would like to see if we could look into making sure that, um, you know, that it's subjects that are clearly relevant to things that we'll be working on here as a, as a council that we can seek that training and, and potentially be reimbursed for that. I don't know how you, I don't know how you would come up with a method of figuring out what is relevant and what's excessive too. So I don't know, there's some balancing act there. So I'm, I will have to look at our budget and look at our policy. I think the easiest way is if we have um, funding. We don't have a lot of funding, so I, I want to make that as clear as possible. But if we have some, maybe it's dividing up and say, okay, this is how much you get and uh, however you see fit on applying for that, whether it's a conference or, I mean, because we, we do pay for conferences for, Actually, I don't even know if we've gone. I think we we had a counselor go last year, but it's been very minimal because of COVID. Um, so there hasn't been a lot of travel um, and there's also the opportunities for a hybrid. So I'll have to look into that additional 
um, and I'm open to suggestions on how you want to. So I'm not going to speak for the PA, but I don't think there's any question, you know, when you have a, a substance, substantive uh, teaching to MSRC, which is a both private and governmental entity, that that would be re reimbursable. Um, you know, I will just tell you personally, and especially when I was, there were years where I, I literally put in a million miles on one airline. I was traveling all the time and I had to seek reimbursement. And some of those travel vouchers were, were pretty complicated, not with the county, with the Army, with the Department of Defense. Since I've been a counselor, I have not made one reimbursement request, not one. One, because I don't want to fill out the paperwork. And two, I already feel like I'm getting uh, the car allowance that more than compensates um, the travel that I have. But there really shouldn't be a legal issue with it. Yeah, there's not a legal issue with that. Um, there are some parameters, um, like with mileage and stuff like that. But I want to make sure that we have enough funds as well, because while I agree MRC has great trainings, I may not be able to send a counselor to a training a month for a year because we can't afford it. But and I think that gets to a different point, though. There should be an approval process if there's something substantive. I hey, I'm going to Washington, D.C. to go to a NACO conference for two weeks, and then you've got hotels that are 400 bucks a night and air travel. Yeah. Maybe there should be, hey, I want to do this travel. Do you approve, county manager? Do we have the funds for it? Yeah, and if we, and if it's going to deplete the majority of funds set aside, it might be that we bring it to council and have council decide that, yes, this makes sense. So that implies that the approval is given in advance, which is certainly appropriate. And, you know, I just received, probably everybody did, a listing of trainings from MRSC that was, I, I believe, uh, nine trainings over the next month. And so this can so easily kind of go crazy with, oh, I can go there because it's sponsored by MRSC. Well, no, it kind of depends on the subject of the of the conference or of the of the training. And then I got, and I'm sure everyone else did, uh, three invitations to conferences that were for January, but none of them were sponsored by the county. And that can go <laughs> really big in terms of expenses way too fast. So if we take a, a line on this for having a, a policy, um, let's be sure that it is for approval in advance, things that are sponsored by the county and that are job relevant to being a counselor. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So I think that would be a chair responsibility combined with the county manager to make sure resources are available. I, I don't foresee it'll happen because I will tell you, I'm not going to seek reimbursement for anything I go to from here until I'm done. But, you know, if, if a counselor does start, I'm going to every conference available everywhere in the country because we do get those invites and they all are foreseeably relevant uh, to our business here. Uh, there should be a process in place, an approval process by the manager. And maybe, you know, if there's competition among counselors to go to any individual um, event, you know, that gets into scheduling and quorum and finances. So that would be a chair decision. I mean, I can see that being a problem. It hasn't been, uh, but it could be. It could be. Okay, we'll take a look at some um, possible language and stuff and bring that back. Uh, so under B, um, I think the chair had added some language. And it's actually associated with this uh, about meal expenses associated with special events, such as departmental retreats and events at which Clark County requests representation from the council are reimbursable. Uh, and then on C, the money is limited to expenses um, before it said, such as lodging meals, grounds, and the chair um, said of lodging meals and ground transportation. Hearing nothing. Um, just for um, on the item that's on the screen now under counselor conduct, 
I'll probably have um, a suggested edit on that first sentence there of each counselor <laughs> is obligated to follow the code of ethical conduct because that's now in code. So I'll, I just want to reference that that's in code and no longer part of the rules of procedure. Any other um, suggested edits or questions on counselor conduct? <coughs> Okay, uh, rules of procedure, which is the second one. <clears throat> Actually, it's the last main section. Oh, I, I apologize. I did have a comment for C. Okay. Um, I would encourage considering adding the input of citizens and our boards of commissions into this paragraph. Can you expand on that a little bit? Are you um, well, it's 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 speaking about how we should seek input from citizens and such, and I just felt it was an extra level to just add in there that we seek input from our boards and commissions. Citizens is already in there, but boards and Are commissions. Are we referring to the code different. changes? To I'm referring to Councilor Conduct C, letter C. It, I mean, it's a really minor thing. I'm just making sure I'm finding out in the right section. So it's in C, the council encourages amendments to the county code that will enhance service to citizens. In reviewing such code changes, the council will seek input from the county manager, legal, or the appropriate county staff. Is that the sentence you're wanting to put boards and commissions? Yeah, and, and add perhaps citizens and boards and commissions to that. Yeah, I agree with that as well. I mean, I do that all the time. I ask informed citizens, hey, help us. What do you suggest? Mm -hmm. And it could be an organization uh, as well. Hey, this is within your sphere of influence. You're ex as expert as our staff. We need your input. I mean, I do it all the time with a wide variety of constituents. So it should be added. I'm yeah, sure. should be a no brainer. Okay. Any other suggested edits on that? Rules of procedures, again, this is the last section before we go into the exhibits. Is there any suggested edits or input on this? Okay, not hearing any. Um, so on exhibit one, um, we have the preamble and then we go into the code of professional conduct for the Clark County Council. The only um, edit I made in this section was the formatting, just to make it consistent with the rest of the document. So instead of seeing the number, we see the I representing one, if you can scroll down just a little bit. And then under section five, absences of county counselors, before we go there, could I just make a comment under uh, four? Uh, and this is uh, the uh, second sentence. Counselors should engage in conduct that promotes county processes and practices that contribute to, I would suggest, uh, deleting the perception of and have it just read contribute to equity and impartiality rather than the goal being the perception of those Convince things. Convince everybody that we're doing that. <laughs> yes, I agree. Thank you. Any other feedback? Okay. So and now if we go down to the paragraph under item five, um, you'll see some blue edits. These were um, suggested by Chair Bowerman. Actually, I had another comment before we, because I think we'll talk about that for a while. Um, 
uh, there's nothing really in here that I saw related to possible conflict of interest, and I think I get asked about that, what, what happens if there's a, you know, and that can be perceived conflict of interest or actual conflict of interest, or, but some uh, getting guidance to the council and uh, ability to declare those things uh, when it comes up. Some of that is in the RCW relative to ethics too. Thank you. And uh, it's also contained in the county code that re relates to ethics as well, as well as uh, I believe the charter also mentions it in uh, human resource policies as well. I can certainly reference uh, the codes where we, it's called out before for code of ethics and code of conduct. I can say pursuant to Clark County code. That sounds great. Are we ready to see the blue or do we have other comments? Okay, so these, again, this is under item five, absences of county counselors. And the second sentence there on the, oops, sorry, second paragraph, um, except in the case of unforeseen emergency, the notice of absence and reason for absence, which has um, been added, must be provided at least five days in advance, it was 10 um, in advance. And then at the meeting at which the counselor is absent, the chair or vice chair may acknowledge the excused or unexcused absence of the counselor. And the absence will be considered excused if the notice is provided at least five days in advance and it is within the definition that follows. Or if it's an emergency deemed excusable by the county manager and chair. And then the last sentence, virtual attendance at meetings with hybrid options are not noted as either excused or unexcused unless the counselor does not activate his or her video to show engagement in the meeting. And I will stop there first, unless you want me to continue on uh, with the, the next section there. If I may just comment by moving it from 10 days to five, I don't mean to be getting lax here, but I just felt like 10 days is a lot in advance to really know what our schedules are. And so um, I'm comfortable with five. That's, that's why the change. I would just add not to complicate things, but when we had discussed this before, when we were first putting it in, because it was such a problem, uh, we we avoided the issue of boards and committees. You know, someone signs up, gets appointed to a committee, and then never goes, never attends, never reports back to us what they've done. You know, that's something that's not addressed at all. And I don't know that we want to address it because then it becomes I think pretty cumbersome uh, for both the chair uh, and the county manager. Um, I don't know that we've ever had a complaint by any board chair that said, hey, your counselor never shows up. Yes, we have. <laughs> but anyway, I, I just throw that out there that this only is attendance at our meetings. Well, and chair and council, if I can just point out to that point, it's not maybe very specific, but the very first paragraph of absences of county counselors does mention that county councils are expected to fulfill the obligations throughout the duration and it includes attendance at all council meetings, work sessions, as well as committees, boards. But thanks for pointing that out. Where is it? Which? So that's, it starts on page 15 at the bottom and then it's at the top of page 16. Okay, yeah, thank you. I guess we did add it in. Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, so just a continuation on that same section there, um, excuse absences of a county counselor an emergency deemed excusable by the county manager and council chair health related issues which cannot be rescheduled to comport to county needs, 
Council members shall comply with RCW. And I can't really read that RCW number. Um, and then if a councilor still says absent, unexcused for chair, is that supposed to be three months? Uh, or let me think. I'm sorry. Uh, it, no. Yes, it had been six, not consecutive. And this would change it to three consecutive. The RCW okay. 35A.12.60, as Leslie pointed out, is actually directed to cities. So this would, by saying three consecutive, it just makes it consistent with the RCW requirement for cities. And we may or may not want to do that, but that's out there for consideration. So do we want to delete the RCW reference since it is for cities? Well, I don't think so. Um, you you could say something like council members uh, shall, shall comply with uh, these uh, the intent of RCW okay. or something like that, um, because it is it is extremely clear. And actually, by making it for three consecutive council meetings or council time sessions or whatever. It is not as stringent as we had it in the past for just six during a 12 month period. So I don't know if this council would wish to make that change or not, but it's a consideration, you know, because the consecutive business kind of communicates that that counselor is more tuning out from his or her responsibilities in my opinion, and I think in, that's why the RCW is written that way for cities. <laughs> Chair, I have a couple comments. Go ahead. Um, you know, I did not have a chance to review that particular RCW, but I'm fundamentally opposed to this. To me, I don't I don't understand why we would ever have three unexcused absences, whether they're in sequence or not. You know, in the private industry, you have one excused absence. You're in, you know, good possibility that you won't have a job anymore. And I think this is the job of the people. I think it's incredibly important. And to be honest with you, I don't know why we would ever have one excuse, unexcused absence for many meetings. So. I am definitely not in favor of loosening this. I would be more in favor of, of increasing the expectations on it. Well, the other thing that just as a comment that this RCW allows is the termination of the counselor from his or her role uh, for failure to meet duty. I think we better call up that RCW real quick here. Can somebody do that? Chair, I have it open um, at the moment. So I'll, I'll read it to the council. It says vacancy for non-attendance. So in addition, a council position shall become vacant if the council member fails to attend three consecutive regular meetings of the council without being excused by the council. Okay, that makes a significant difference. <laughs> uh, I don't know if there's, um, do we have kind of like a, like a, uh, okay, I, I, I want to say that I, I feel like one unexcused absence is more than enough, but not enough to remove somebody from office. But is there another method that we have? Um, I don't know, do we have another method among ourselves, like not, does that, I'm sorry, I'm not we putting do, the correct We do, words counselor, but it's things like removing the counselor from his or her committee assignments. But I've got to tell you, in the past when we've experienced that, that would have been a, almost like a reward, not a punishment. So there's not much. Public punishment if I can... is listed as one of our uh, opportunities, too. I don't think that would amount to much, really. So I agree with the 
we need to tighten this up as much as possible. None of this was even in place until we addressed it last year or two years ago. And, and the reality was, you know, state law, there's no remedy other than if you're incapacitated to be removed from an elected position. It's very different from private employment. So this is to kind of fill the gap. And I agree that it should be tight, I mean, as tight as possible. And whether it's consecutive, concurrent, or whatever, I mean, I, I don't want to complicate it. I think it should be simple. I mean, we're getting paid for this. We should be here. But the reality is some previous counselors had other jobs, and then it caused them to miss our our job with without being excused. Uh, so um, I want to keep it simple. I want to keep it tight, and we've had a lot of this discussion before. I think this is a good step forward and good comments uh, to enter the new year, 2023. Chair Barrowman, uh, if I may, um, I request an opportunity to research this issue because as elected officials, I don't know that the council has the power to vacate a counselor position. That would be done by recall. Um, so I would like the opportunity to look at that particular issue. I understand the language of, you know, maybe stating that they're, you know, being removed from their. So I'm not sure what you just said because we already know it, we have no authority to remove them from office. To give them different committee assignments by charter is three votes. We should be able to do that no matter what. Mm -hmm. That was actually exercised by a couple, a few counselors two years ago. Um, so I think that, that's mixing apples and oranges. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Medvedi. What I was, and I'm sorry if I didn't state it clearly, that is correct that the council has the par power to do that um, if, regarding the excuse um, or unexcused absences to remove them from committees. But the RCW 35A 12060 states that. A council position shall become vacant if the council member fails to attend. And I don't see that the council has the authority to do that regarding a county councilor that has been elected by um, the public. And then I wonder, the RCW is directed to city councilors who are elected by the public. Seems like there's no difference there. But I, I would say that if we adopt something like this, it would behoove us, I think, to take the language of the RCW and put it in here rather than referencing the number, don't you think? Because then referencing the number doesn't communicate the meaning. And, and it's short, sure, sorry. it's just a couple sentences. Yes, go ahead. Um, thank you, Chair Bowerman. Um, I, I think it would be appropriate if the council were to include the three or more consecutive unexcused, but I, I don't believe that the language contained in the 35A12060 that says they, if there were three or more consecutive unexcused absences, that they would be vac considered vacant from their position. I don't, I'd have to do some research into this. I don't know why that's contained in the um, code for uh, city um, officials, but um, typically uh, elected officials are not considered vacant or removed from office unless unless they've been recalled. And interestingly, it's beyond the city code. It is in state law. Here, you know. This is Sue. I have a some questions and comments on just to make sure I understand this. So the three uh, consecutive, so it could be a council meeting, a council work session, and council time. So that could be three just in one week. So it could be that if someone is unexcused for two weeks, then measures go into play. Now, given that they're uh, so do, uh, do I understand that correctly? I, I think you're correct. Some not written. Yeah. Uh, given that there was 
really, I understand nothing in place prior uh, that I am concerned about swinging too far in the opposite direction. And I would, um, I just encourage people to, uh, you, you know, I, I think probably in most cases there you, you can make a call and, you know, get an excused absence, but things can come up uh, and I would just encourage people to exercise some compassion in that realm. Uh, my mother is in hospice. I can't predict what's going to happen. She's slowly dying. Um, and the first thing in my mind would not be getting an excused absence. So I just bring that up uh, so we just don't swing too far in the opposite direction and uh, give folks the benefit of the doubt. And I would absolutely oppose anything that would remove someone from office because I think that really is up to the voters to decide who is representing them. Well, I, I completely uh, agree until you got to that last phrase. But an emergency deemed excusable by the county manager and council chair, my goodness sakes, something like what you described, of course, that is excusable. I mean, there is no question about that, Counselor. So, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that I, I yet see a problem. Um, it, you're right. It does call for somebody who is uh, fair-minded to be in those two positions, but I can't imagine that we would ever have somebody who would not acknowledge that that kind of an excuse, which we actually had this last year as well, that it is excusable. They didn't even ask to be excused. Um, and, you know, it, they didn't need to. <laughs> it, was, it wasn't necessary. If I may, so a couple, one point of clarification. So number one, this isn't a swing from nothing. We already put this in place in great measure previously. Uh, so we're just making some minor tweaks here. Uh, my understanding is we cannot remove someone from office. There is a provision for recall. There is a provision for medical incapacitation. Someone is on life support and they can't perform, uh, but there's a process for that. Where in this does it say that we can remove people from office? What, what is the language that's troubling here? We talked about boards and committees and just like the chair said, unfortunately, that's, that's, just, that's more re reward than, than punishment. If say, hey, you're relieved from all your work responsibilities on all these committees because you haven't been going to them, that doesn't kind of pass the common sense test. But I so think Leslie, the, is I, there something in the code here that, or these no, changes that says we can remove people from office? I and Leslie can answer to you, but there's nothing in there now. I think the reference to the RCW that applies to cities talks about vacancies, but there is nothing here, no. And if anything, if you scroll up just a little bit, the violation of this has already been established. Of course, you can amend this as well. Um, which includes, you know, a cease and desist violation, public admonishment, a uh, resolution of censure, you know, and the boards and committees. But there's nothing in writing now that talks about vacating a position. It's only referenced in the RCW that is for city specifically. Thank you. We, we've just had so much discussion. <laughs> I was like, where did we, this come from? And I have, you know, I've had people in my family and in hospice and my heart goes out and I've got an elderly mom right now. It's just really a matter of notifying the chair, notifying the county manager and that we follow HIPAA too. You know, we don't have to know. Everyone's going to be fair about this. This is to address those that just didn't show up. And yeah, I hope that that isn't going to be the practice here, uh, but it should be in our rules. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm ready to move on. Just one last thing. I do agree with that. I think it should be centered. I, I don't think anybody should be punished in any way for excusable absences. Nobody can control those events in their lives. But I do, and and you know, building on Council Council Marshall's comment, 
uh, and I think we are correct here. I don't think there's any way we can remove somebody from office, but when, you know, to her comment about let the voters decide, I think if we do have a council member that is consistently unexcused absences, I think that that information should be out there for the voter to be able to make a decision in, in future election. And that was exactly the discussion we had. We needed a violation of rule to make it public. You know, I kind of went through this as a judge because we had a lot of judges, not here. Just, you know, we made up our own rules as far as how much vacation time you could take and sick leave time you can take. And then the local paper started making public records requests. Who's not coming to court? And all the judges panicked, not me, because I was going to court. Uh, but if you don't have a rule in place that can provide transparency to the public, then you're really keeping it from the public. And so that, that was the main point of putting this in here. So, hey, this, this counselor is not doing their job. So the public can vote and they know. So many papers will actually cover it, but anyway. Is there any suggested edits um, from what was presented in the section today? Yes, I, I, I think, think we, what is in blue in the RCW uh, for clarity should be extracted and stated clearly. And then it's easier to discuss and understand. And if it's okay, Chair, um, Leslie can do some legal research to ensure that the items that would be taken from RCW and put in the code um, that we can legally do as a county. One, one last clarification. I don't know that we ever came to consensus on six versus three and consecutive versus non-consecutive, whatever, uh, whatever, I don't want to say punishment, right? But whatever consequences come from it, I personally believe that we should start at a, a bare mat or a maximum of, or, sorry, bare minimum of three. That, yeah. Okay. So basically, I am not in favor of six, and definitely not in favor of it being in sequence. So I think that that it should start sooner. You know, there shouldn't be those unexcused absences. So what are you proposing? So I propose that we amend six to three and in sequence, just getting rid of in sequence. That's a consecutive? What's that? A consecutive, that word. <laughs> Yeah, getting rid of consecutive, so that's not a requirement. And, you know, um, my uh, uh, failure uh, to take out within a 12-month period, that was what applied to the six, so that should have been crossed out too in this proposed change. Because either, either you go with three or if you go with six, then within a 12 month period makes sense. But if you've got lesser and lesser number, then it probably doesn't, it becomes too stringent. Going back to my comment about keeping it simple and tight, I would agree three, eliminate consecutive. It'll all be done fairly. And I think hey, this will not be a problem with, with the five people I see seating, seated in, in their positions today. Uh, so I just want to keep it as simple as possible so we don't get into these little loopholes on what, whether it was consecutive or not. And anyway. Okay, so it would be three in a 12 month period. Unexcused. Nothing's approved today. I will make the edit in here and we can discuss it uh, further next week. Okay, I think that's all, unless anybody else has any suggested edits. Um, I believe the very last um, sentence on here was also had that designation um, of the vacancy, but we will, um, legal, not we, legal, will look at the RCW and see if that language applies to counties, and if so, we can expand um, yeah. that new section D. My intent had not been for that language per se 
to be used by the county because cities are not counties and vice versa. However, given their rules, a county and a city could have, I'm not saying should have, comparable rules. The latter is what the intent was. So um, it was it was to pick up the content of that to apply to the county if appropriate and if desired. So yeah, understood. I think we're, yeah. I think we're on the same page, but we just want to make sure whatever language that we use for the county is allowable by law. So, but um, yeah, so we will do that and bring back um, information, whether it's suggested language or a legal answer on some of that, what we can do or can't do. Any other, um, right now, any other questions or suggested edits in the rules of yes. procedure? If legal says, oh no, you can't do that. Bad, 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 because that's whatever, you know, not allowed. Okay, then what would be an improvement? If they would provide a suggested approach, because I think you can see where we're we're wanting to go in a general direction, if you could help us get there. Leslie, that I'm not was sure I'm clear. I'm not sure where if we've agreed on where we want to go, if that could be clarified. Uh, no, I'm not sure we have either. I don't think we have, but as a proposal. I think it's pretty clear where the proposal is intended to go. And so if that could be suggested, might be better than what's here, probably would. Thank you. All right. Um, do you need a break before we do boards and assignments? You're too generous. <laughs> Let's just power through. Okay. Nobody wants a break. Okay, if you could please pull up the rules of procedure, or the, sorry, the assignments. And I did send to council this morning a link to the boards and commissions, and it actually has links to some of their bylaws, and it has a little summary of what they are. Um, I'm not sure if all of them are included on there, but I think a lot of them were. So um, this can go a couple different ways. Um, if we could go one by one um, to see, you know, who's interested in the primary and alternate, or we can start by counselors um, providing feedback on what they would like to be on. Is there a preference on? Yeah, let's um, kind of go down through the list so that we cover the waterfront there, so to speak. Is this, um, staff, is this interactive online so we can actually hit the little X button as we're talking? Okay, thank you. Okay, so Board of Health, that's everybody. So that's an easy one. Um, the council is determined as the Board of Health. The second is the Industrial Revenue Bond Board, which is also the full council. So I'm just gonna move down to where it's not full council. Um, the Emergency Medical Services District Board number two. This is the chair plus one. I, I have an interest, uh, and I'm assuming we can just say I'm interested and then we'll arm wrestle after that. To what interest level? If, you, if you're interested, well, let's just all say if we're interested and then we can I don't know. How would you like to proceed? Do we have to make? Well, is anyone change? else interested in that particular emergency medical services district? In addition to Sue. So again, I, 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 I apologize, and I don't mean to slow this process down, but there are, are ones that I feel are really important. I mean, this one in particular, I have interest, but um, if some if it's for somebody's top, you know, high level priority, then I would be glad to let them accept that, if that makes any sense. And I can share just, um, and I'm gonna look at staff, because Tina, you know, has been here longer, I think, than all of us and has a history. Um, but this board, I believe, only meets maybe once or twice a year. 
and it's the cities they rotate um, what's there's three people on the board so there's a counselor there's a city representative that rotates through the cities and I can't remember who the third board member is but it's it's very minimal they get data from AMR and the doctor on calls and what's making sense as a county um, countywide so it, there is a limited number of times that this board meets if two counselors wanted to be on that board, I would be happy to relinquish my spot. We'll have a, we will have a we will have a quorum issue if we have three counselors, and then we would have to open up that board to the public. My interest well, in it. What I was is... saying was, I would be happy to relinquish my spot because I don't think the chair is required on that one. The I believe the chair is required on that board. Are we so talking about to me. district board number two? Yes. My copy sounds... says two counselors plus the city. Oh, I see what's up up here. Where did that come from? Okay, that's it's fine. That I really push my spot. Okay. <laughs> so can may we may we put Sue in there? I think Lynn wants it. I kind of would like to see what I wind up with. Yeah, that's <laughs> at the uh, end of the, at the uh, end of all of them, and and then uh, we can. So say, this this uh, yeah. I I don't know if maybe it would be more productive for us to verbalize which boards or commissions are really important that we really want to get on and maybe discuss those because this also this particular assignment would be very secondary to me, so. I would rather wait to see which boards and commissions that I can potentially get on that I'm very interested in before I make decisions on ones that are, um, you know, not my expertise, but sound interesting. Does that make sense? Well, this has never been this complicated before. I think we just go down the list, and if you want to do it, do it, and we'll put your put a check next to your initial. Uh, we fulfill all of the obligated ones that we need to fulfill. Um, and then at the very end, if you say, oh my gosh, I signed up for 40 boards, I can't do them all, then we'll, we'll have to adjust. But I, I've i never seen this, um, I mean, we used to just run through it and, hey, do you want it? who wants to do it? Okay, you want to do it? You're on. Okay. Let's, um, I love let's that just method. Take, you can treat that as kind of a draft and then if it, and you can change it at the end, end depending on what you're on. If you want to switch things at the end, it's not, yeah, it's not set in stone. Okay. I, I prefer at this point to go ahead and pass on that. Okay. We'll put you on as an alternate. Is that okay? For which one? For board number two? This is, yes. So it would be the chair, um, Councillor Marshall, and Councillor Young as the alternate. And again, we can change it at the end. If you want. <laughs> okay, so the next one is CTRAN, which is a chair plus one counselor. I'm interested in that. Come on. I am too. Chair Barman, can you hear that? Yes. Okay. So, do you want me to comment or? <laughs> So can one be the alternate and, or do we need to vote on who gets it besides the chair? I can be the alternate. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, Michelle Belcott is penciled in and Sue is in the alternate spot. For RTC, for RTC, I really think we need to let Gary in on that one because he's chair. Well, so I did want to express an interest in remaining in a position and I was um, recently elected chair. I'm interested in that board, Madam Chair. Is right. this one really chair plus two? Yes. So we have a quorum and it's publicly notified and everything, okay. Right. That I mean, that would be one that I would be interested in as well.
Do we have an alternate there already? No. So right Would now you we like have to be in the chair. So we have three counselors for two spots for regular, and then we need an alternate. So we have Councillor Mevaji as one of them, um, and then Councillor Belcott and Councillor Young have both expressed interest. Well, I'll take alternate. Great. Okay, the Vancouver Library Capital Facilities Area Board, again, this is like an annual meeting that um, they present their capital facilities budget to the council. Chair plus two. I'm interested in that one. And the meeting is usually right before a regular council meeting. So there's not um, any travel or anything involved with that. So did we get the second one? Already? No. This is one annual meeting? Uh, yes, I would say yes, but I don't know if they've ever done a special meeting. I think it's just one annual meeting where you're looking at It, it really is just literally 10 minutes before our normal yes. meeting. Sure. Nothing to do with the I'm on it now, but I'm happy to relinquish it if you want to. No, we need to. We need to. For continuity purposes, <laughs> continue on. Okay, so Councillor Mebaji, I'm putting you, you on there. If you don't want to do it, then... No, that's fine. I'll, okay. I'll... And then Councillor Young as alternate? Sure. Okay. Clark County Reserve Officers Relief and Pension Board. This is a board that supports the CCSO. They don't meet often. I don't even know if you guys have ever met. I, I think I was on it for two years and never went. We never had a meeting, so I don't know what they do or when. And it's a chair plus one. Let me start picking. So I already, um, Councilor Mapaji, I think you're, you got picked. <laughs> okay, thank you. And who would like to be an alternate? I'll be alternate. Thank you, Councilor Belcott. Elections Canvassing Board. So this is um, the chair or the chair may designate others for specific meetings. Some of these meetings are required to be in person. Councilor Mevaji has become a, a close party uh, in the elections. Um, so it's, it definitely does take time during the election time um, on the yes. canvassing board. Councilor Belcott is going to be the designee for the February 14 election. Um, so, you know, we do that on kind of an as needed basis. When the election comes up, we talk to the counselors who might be available. I say we, I talk to them. Well, and Chair and Council, if I could just jump in um, for this particular um, position, uh, there is training that is required for this. So that training would need to occur, um, you know, sometime before the election. Excellent point. Yes, I'm good with that. I'm yeah. I'm interested in that. One. Okay, and it's Anybody all else? very interesting. I would add. Mm -hmm. if so you, if other you than haven't done it before, especially. Any other counselor wanting to do this other than Councillor Belcott? Well, if you need an alternate, election, we I'll may be... have the need for someone else. We'll see. Oh. So this is one by state law that the chair does it unless designated. Okay. So we don't need Michelle's going to be the designee. That's great. And the training's minimal. Mm -hmm. um, I could be the alternate. Yeah, and since it is just the chair, I would encourage if all of you can actually take the training because we have had a hiccup where we somebody needed to be in person and we had nobody. I think it was end up being Councilor Mavaji potentially and became an issue. So I would actually encourage all of you to take the training so that if we need some assistance, you can get pulled in um, if needed. Okay, emergency commissioner is the chair. Finance committee is the chair. Identity of Clark County is the chair. Uh, the law library is the chair. Okay, mental health sales tax board. This is a chair plus one. 
Um, so they do review proposals that come in both internally and externally for funding requests. Um, and we do have some internal leadership who's also on the board um, that reviews it that have its knowledge of that. So it's a chair plus one. That one I would definitely be interested in. I'd be interested in that one too. And I'm interested in it as well and continuing on it. It took a couple of years for me to get on it and, and it, it is a very important position. Yeah, and just um, anything that's recommended for funding does come back to the full council uh, for approval. And we can always do council time um, information as well on that. I'll withdraw then. Uh, Councilor Medfiji, how long have you been on it? Uh, just this past year. Okay, I'd, I'd be happy to take alternate. Okay. Thank you. So it will be Councilor Medvedji and... Chair. Chair. About the committees, that one is up in the, the top third for sure as far as being time consuming. It's important, but it, it does take a bit of uh, dedicated time to review the applications and so on. Yeah, and just... To give a little bit more detail, during the pandemic, this didn't meet, and which was really unfortunate. And it took a while to even find out that they weren't meeting, at least from my point of view. Yeah, and they were the prior year before the pandemic. There was a lot of money that was distributed, and the local organizations didn't have the capacity, or they couldn't, based on COVID restrictions, spend the money that they had at that time as well. But yes, it's very. It's an important tax that we have um, supporting. Okay, uh, school advisory committee, this is the chair plus one. Um, they haven't, they didn't meet one year, I think in the, during the pandemic, but I think we're doing twice a year now. And I don't know if it's virtual or hybrid. We used to meet virtual. in this room. It's virtual. It's virtual. Yeah. Okay, and it's a meeting with the schools and the superintendents. I'm interested in that one. I'm interested in that one, but would be happy to take the alternate position. Super. So, uh, Councillor Belcott will be primary, and Councillor Marshall will be the alternate. Area Agency on Aging and Disabilities of Southwest Washington. I'll step up, uh, but. I uh, would reconsider depending on my total at the end of this. Okay. Thank you. So, Councillor Marshall, any alternate? Councillor Mamaji, just well, as you're looking at me. I've done it before, I, and it's a great organization. But at, and for some of these alternates, we've used staff as well from communities. It can be, and it could be that if, you know, if we don't want to identify an alternate, if it means coming up that we know somebody can't attend, we can make, recommend, or call the council and see if somebody's available. We can do that as well. Yeah, so I'd, I'd rather not volunteer even as an alternate. I'll put a little slash on. Actually, uh, I've worked with them and this could be something I'm very happy participating in. Great, thank you. Uh, so the Children's Justice Center, CJC, they meet monthly um, and with other board members, including the PA, the sheriffs, I think the city's on there. I think Councilor Mavaji might be on the committee now and um, can probably talk. No, I've been doing this one uh, the whole time I've been a counselor. I've, it, was this a required position or was this a voluntary position that we filled? That, that was one question I had. I'd have to look at their bylaws. I'm in. Are you a voting? Are you a voting member? Me? Yes. Yeah. So then I would think we want to maintain that. Well, I, 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 and it's children that got me into the law, and that's mainly what I did as a lawyer and prosecutor, and um, and I worked at our juvenile justice center for quite a while as a judge. So I, I would like to keep this. I'm interested as well, but could serve as an alternate. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, audit Oversight Committee, so this is when um, 
there's a request for our internal auditors to, 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 to conduct um, audits, such as the overtime audit. We had that one done. There's one on contract management. There's one on some public work stuff right now. So they meet every once in a while. It could be quarterly. Um, and it's with Greg Kinsey and the auditor um, staff that work under them. And there's a community member who's also on this board to provide some direction on what audits should be done as well as receiving and going over the findings of the audit. I'm interested in this one. Okay. I'd be a, a happy backup on that one. Marshall. Oops, I wrote on the wrong one. Okay. Um, the by state coordination committee. Right now we don't have, do we not have anybody on that? I'm not sure what they do, but uh, I've spent a lot of time in both states and would be happy to serve. Kathleen, this is one that hasn't met in a long, long time. It hasn't met in the entire five years I've been here. Okay. Mm -hmm. It existed um, prior to as part of the original Columbia River Crossing um, effort, but it has it was never formally disbanded, um, so it technically still exists, but it hasn't met. Okay, thank you. So we'll add Councilor Marshall, and maybe this will be the year. Uh, the next one is the Washington Investment Board. This is a as needed, and it looks like if you're meeting, it's in Stevenson. So, Lindsay, is this another one that they're not meeting or haven't been meeting? They haven't met on this one. I think there just hasn't been the need. Um, so, they haven't met on this one in at least three or four years. Either we can put a counselor down now, or we can bring it up at council time if there's a need for this meeting and see who's available. Let's do the matter. If nobody is excited to join now. <laughs> okay, that works. All right, uh, CREDC Board of Directors. And then the, the one below that is the Executive Committee, and that's the same counselor for both. I'd be happy to be an alternate. And Karen, are you doing that one now? Not now, I had done that in the past and I, I really have to give them a shout out because it is a very interesting group to be part of when you talk about economic development and um, to the extent that their reports can be augmented to what comes to council, so much the better. So it's a, it's a good board to be part of and the uh, same person who is on the board is normally on the executive committee. At least I was, and that worked well. Councilor Marshall, did you say that you were interested as an alternate or the primary? I, I could go either way. Well, since I am not a primary on one yet, I suppose I would be willing to do that. Okay, thank you. College Tribal Foundation. This is for two counselors. Now, um, and there is a steep learning curve on that one, so I'm very happy to continue. I'd be interested in this one too. I've been involved with grants, grant writing over the years and foundations, so I'm really interested in this one. Okay. Super. I'm also interested, but Councilor Marshall has me beat, so happy to let her take that. Okay, can I put you down as an alternate? Sure. Thank you. Discover Discovery Clean Water Alliance. I'd like that one. I think that uh, serves largely North County. Alternate, Councilor Mavaji. I have, it, it's it's a passion of yours. Sure, I no, it is a. I I will be an alternate. Thank, Thank you. you. Assuming that you go to every meeting and I don't. <laughs> okay. uh, the next one is Elder Justice Executive Board.
Sounds like it's um, monthly, it's virtual. Every other month. So I've done that before. I did, I don't know who replaced me. Can't remember now. Um, maybe it was Temple. I'm like, I'm happy to do it again if no one volunteers. Thank you. Alternate. Any alternate? Alter Belcott. It's like everybody avoids. Don't look at Kathleen. <laughs> For the team. Thank you. Uh, ending community homeless. Business organization or ECHO. This is for two counselors. They meet monthly with the city of Vancouver. Counselor. This this would be the one that I would ask for. I'm interested in this one as well. And I, and would, definitely I would like make a to continue. For Councillor Medvigy, since he's been serving beautifully as chair. Yes, and, and I, I did help in the formation of the original joint um, committee that we then reformed into this uh, ECHO uh, organization. So I, I really would like to continue because I still feel like we're in the formative stages and making really good progress. We now have pretty good attendance generally and usually excellent discussion and we're starting to see outcomes now. So this is an important uh, committee between for all the stakeholders in the county. So I guess I would say that District 1 is certainly the most affected by this issue, and I feel like they should be represented. And I've also attended many of the previous meetings, including participated in the last one. I would say District 2 is also affected. I've been really involved in District 2 in um, coordinating, um, getting some homeless issues resolved with um, getting different people help or moving different camps or business owners with security concerns. Um, I will take the alternate. Thank you. And, the, and this is also on CVTV, so. Um, just wanted to share that. Go ahead, Councilor Mavaji. Sorry. No, I was just going to say I suggested uh, Council Bowerman that you know maybe um, we'll go position by position, and I would just ask that you vote on mine first. Uh, and if I'm not selected uh, to continue, uh, I think we're okay. And the problem may be solved. I, I think that uh, it was you and I and. Councillor Belcott said she would be an alternate. Okay, I didn't hear okay, that. Right? You want to be an alternate? I would like to be the primary, but how do we? <laughs> is it rock paper scissors? <laughs> okay. Do we want further um, discussion on this? Well, so. Or do we want to come back to it after we continue down the rest of the. Oh, I think we should deal with it now. But okay. I heard you are wanting to be an alternate or not wanting to be an alternate. I would like to be primary, but I don't want to. Yeah, I don't want to. Okay, well, I, I'm just going to go back to the original proposal. Vote for me or not. Uh, and then. Let's vote for the next position or not um, to make it fair. Up to the chair. Energy, you have probably talked to these two individuals and maybe more about being on ECHO. Um, do you have any thoughts about requirements of the person there or um, anything? Who would, you know, and I'm, what I'm getting at is the background of whom would make a good representative for the, the council here? Yeah, I, I, other than um, speaking up on behalf of myself, I don't want to uh, speak out against one of my fellow, brand new fellow counselors. 
if that's what you're asking me to do, I don't, I don't want to do that. I, you know, uh, this it's a stakeholder group. We're getting good participation, uh, different frame of references. Um, I, I guess to be fair, the only thing I would say is, Glenn, I, I don't know if you're too close to Vancouver's interest because uh, as apart from count, the county interests, which are different, um, although we have, I mean, it's a regional issue, it's a national issue. Um, I mean, having said that, I, I think we should just go ahead and select by vote. Can I have an opportunity to address that? So I think that Clark County's interests are amendable. They, they can change over time. I don't think we have anything on, on specific paper that says what Clark County's interests are versus what the cities are. I think it's a, it has to be a coordinated effort between all jurisdictions. Would council like to vote on the individuals or? wait till the end, it's up to you. So do, um, Chair, do you have a preference on council taking a vote now on the three, on who the two primary and who will be the alternate will be? Let's vote at the end. Okay. Okay, the next one is the fairgrounds liaison. I'd like that one. I'll be alternate on that. Thank you. Uh, the J Pact. I think this was discussed a little bit before. And I, Lindsay, is this the one that we have staff on? Um, this is the one is that the that Pact served on oh. both J Pack and M Pack. So actually, I think is the J Pack the one that RTC chooses, and there's more seats than there should be. Am I saying that correctly? As council, does council still have a seat, or is it CTRAN? So there is some confusion here, and I'm not sure I, maybe Lindsay can inform us better, but you know, I originally was told by the staff at RTC that it was selected by RTC. Um, and the current or the previous chair, who also is a director of the CEO of CTRAN, expressed an interest that CTRAN should hold that seat on JPEC because they had a vested interest in transportation issues into Southwest uh, or North, I'm not sure what you call the Portland metro area, into the Portland metro area. So he had asked um, RTC to consider appointing him to the seat that Clark County had because I think um, Wastat and uh, Vancouver both wanted their seats. So I, I was in favor of that. I, I thought that CTRAN had a good and hard interest in it and they should have that seat. Uh, Temple represented us before on JPAC and I can't ever recall a single issue that she ever brought back to us that was a county issue. So there were two things that I recommended. One that we allow uh, C, um, RTC to appoint uh, CTRAN to that seat or uh, appoint them on a rotational basis so we see how it goes. Are we missing out on issues? I don't know of any, and that's why I'd reached out to Public Works and Lindsay to say, hey, what is the county's interest in this, in this seat? Because I, I think it's really de minimis. Um, so, there is some confusion on on who actually appoints it. Does the Clark County Council appoint the seat, or does RTC appoint the seat? Um, and I know that the last I left it with the director of RTC was there. We're going to have their legal, their general counsel uh, look at the issue, but I haven't heard back on that. Uh, so there is a little bit of confusion. I don't know if Lindsay, if you could clarify. Anything, <laughs> but I am in, I am interested in having CTRAN go ahead and take the seat, even if it's only for the next two years, and we rotate it. 
I think you've captured it um, in terms of the involvement with RTC and um, Councillor Lenz's prior involvement. So I think it's really a policy question for the council as far as um, whether or not there's any um, significant issue that you have with allowing CTRAN to take the seat. I agree. Um, Previously, I know that uh, John Blum served on this. There were a couple of times that I covered that and MPAC. Um, it's rare that it's um, something that is impacting Clark County specifically. You know, I, I certainly think that there's an argument to be made that the entire um, Portland metro area and the transportation network of the Portland metro area, of course, impacts Clark County residents. Um, so it's important that Clark County in some degree, not necessarily the county government, but Clark County have a voice there. Um, and that's the purpose for the seats, but it doesn't really impact Clark County as a governmental entity. And I can share too the um, about the J Pact and the bylaws provide, and I got this information from um, RTC's executive director. Um, the bylaws provide a three seat allotment for Washington members and outlines a procedure for selection of those members in section 2.F. RTC is delegated the selection authority per the bylaws. So I, all I would say is just as an expedient and maybe to clarify, if we say, hey, give the seat to CTRAN, because we have three members on the RTC. I mean, we still have that connection uh, on regional transportation issues. Uh, so anyway, that would be my druthers uh, to basically signal to uh, RTC that um, it would be okay for RTC to appoint uh, CTRAN as, as their representative on JPEG. I, I would support that. And uh, just a question about JPEG, and I wonder what role they play related to the Interstate 5 replacement. Yeah, so JPEG doesn't play a role in terms of the, the Interstate 5 replacement. There is a um, an Oregon and Washington Joint Legislative Transportation Committee. Uh, and so there's certainly some elected officials there that would you know coordinate and have discussions with people on the Oregon side, but it doesn't have a formal relationship with that group um, or any of the groups involved. JPEG, of course, is an advisory committee to Metro, um, and Metro is one of the groups that is one of the eight um, that have a voice in terms of the, the I-5 replacement. So there's kind of a tangential relationship there, um, but they don't have a formal role. Let me revise what I said, not to complicate it a little bit, but where I said rotating basis, if if we're all agreeing or the majority of us agree that C can have it, we could just in our letter or message to RTC basically say, hey, go ahead and appoint uh, CTRAN to, in the Clark County position, um, and we will revisit that every year that we look at our committee assignments. So it would be like on, on an annual basis that we would agree or disagree with that appointment. Any concern with that approach? That's fine with me. I don't know about the way RTC would feel about that, but we could at least suggest it. Okay. Um, so council, those of you here on RTC, maybe you can bring this back during your council reports at a council time. And then if we need to, if we're gonna maintain a seat for any chance we can assign at that point. Okay, the next one is the juvenile justice council and it looks like it's not required for the Ju juvenile justice council. Yeah, and I've been f fulfilling that. I have been going and um, they, from time to time at that one as well, CJC, I do encourage the manager to attend. Um, I, I know it's not required, uh, but there are some issues uh, that come up. I'm happy to keep going to it, but if someone else wants to do it, uh, that's fine. Not hearing one. Um, Law and Justice Council. This is a monthly meeting with um, other local jurisdictions. The PA comes, our sheriff, uh, police chief, state patrol, corrections, the mayor. And so I, I, I am chairing this and this is near and dear to my heart. And I, I think I have built it up. When I first started going, they didn't have any real agenda. They just randomly 
pick topics that were unrelated to doing anything really productive in the county. We've turned that around and we're really looking at very important topics now from jail services to infrastructure to public defense um, and our and now people are attending and we've got good attendance. The only thing I don't like about it is, and it was because of the sheriff, uh, we have it at eight o'clock in the morning um, because that didn't interrupt his workflow. But I would like to con continue to do this. Uh, it, what I suggest if someone else is interested, could we have two members on it? There's no reason why we couldn't. Yeah. I don't think there, I don't know if there's bylaws for that group and if it's resolution yeah okay the resolution yes um, that identifies who needs to be on there but I don't see an issue with two I mean because they're not I don't think they take a lot of votes at the meeting we don't oh. take that many votes we have the resolution needs to be updated because it's really really old and it doesn't right. apply That's so I think we could just update the resolution so anyway I just I would like to remain but if there is someone else maybe we can add a second counselor to it. I mean, it is an important meeting and maybe two would be best. At the risk of taking on too many of these things, I consider being an alternate coming to the occasional meeting. You are not taking on too many. I just did the check marks and counted them. Yeah. <laughs> we count. <laughs> it, it feels like a lot. <laughs> Okay, so we'll keep Councillor Mavici and Councillor Marshall will be alternate. Um, the next one is the Law Enforcement and Firefighter Disability Board. This is actually put on by our HR staff. It's regarding the retirement, I think, um, information. You want to do that? I'm interested in that one. Okay. Anybody <laughs> other than Councillor? Was that, that you, Sue Marshall? <laughs> Councillor Bell, oh, Councillor Belcott. Okay, awesome. So Councillor Belcott, and is there anybody who wants to be the alternate? I'd be happy to. I'm on it now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lower Columbia Fish Recovery Board. I think this is one that Councillor Mavaji is currently on. Yeah, I've been on it the whole time I've been a counselor, I'll continue if no one else wants to take it. I will tell you I'm the world's worst fisherman. <laughs> and, and I don't know, I, can, I don't think I could still differentiate between the different salmon uh, variations, um, but I'm happy to continue. I've been doing a lot of work with them on other issues with Lake Vancouver and Lacamas Lake and trying to get uh, issues on our, our watershed and aquifer as well. They have a lot of expertise in this committee. And I and I will tell you, it's a great committee because they, the director, Steve Manilow, really tees up issues for discussion and voting. Uh, unlike some other committees that kind of just rubber stamp whatever the director wants to do, he really, uh, and we have sport fishermen, we have commercial fishermen, we have scientists, I mean, it's a great board. Um, so if someone has a dying interest in it, I'm certainly willing to become the alternate. You sound like a fit for it to me, Councillor Medvigi. Well, I'm I'm interested, but I could I could go either way on being the lead or the alternate. Well, you choose. And it is hybrid now, uh, so I mean, it, this used to be you know, driving up to Pacifica or Stevens, because it's regional. I mean, it goes from Camp oh. uh, to the Bonneville Jam, Astoria, as, but it is, uh, hybrid. there is a hybrid option. So what, what do you choose? I, I would pick alternate right at the moment. That's fine, I'll, I'll go as the main guy. Thank you. Uh, Metropolitan Policy Advisory Committee, does this fall in line with what we said about JPAC? So this is a little bit different. It's also part of Oregon Metro. Um, 
but this they JPAC is more of a formal group. They make more formal recommendations to uh, the the Oregon Metro. MPAC really is more of a think tank, um, and it's kind of the everything else besides transportation. There's some transportation, but a lot of it is affordable housing or homelessness or um, you know just kind of best practices in local government sharing opportunity. Um, so it's. Uh, historically was at Wednesdays at 5 o'clock in Portland. Um, and so for a while I served as the alternate on this one um, and went over there. They're hybrid now, so it's a little bit easier. Um, but this wouldn't, I don't, I haven't heard any interest from CTRAN. I don't know why CTRAN would be interested in this one. Um, it's a good information gathering, but uh, they don't really do anything um, formal. Well. I'm not interested in serving this on this one, but I would encourage someone to do that uh, because this is more likely you'll get the policy makers at this committee. And if we want to develop relationships or be able to talk about third or fourth or fifth or how many bridges we might want to have in the future, this would be a, a great opportunity to develop those relationships. So that's just a pitch for the committee. Any takers? <laughs> Councillor Young, is this something you might be interested in? My primary list is very short, not because I'm not willing, but I just uh, have conceded a lot. But uh, if nobody else will do that, I will go ahead and fulfill that role. Thank you, Councillor right. Young. That brings you to eight. <laughs> Uh, North Country Emergency Medical. Did I miss one? Oh, do we have an alternate for this for the MPAC? Okay, Councillor Bevagy. Made eye contact. <laughs> okay, now the North Country EMS District. Um, this is. It historically has been Councillor District 5. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take it. Okay. Any other people who want to be on that board? Okay. An alternate. I'll be an alternate since I'm the closest district. Thank you. Councillor Belcott. Okay. Public Health Advisory Committee. I'm interested in this one. Okay. Is that Sue? Anybody else? Yes, it is. You know, I'm really glad to hear that. And let me tell you why. I was, I, I'm currently a member of affectionately called FAC. And I spoke with uh, Dr. Melnick and he was very complimentary of his and your one-on-one -on -one meeting and talked about it at length. So I, I think this is going to be a good uh, relationship. I also was interested in that one, but again, it sounds like Councilor Marshall has me beat, so I'd be happy to be a uh, an alternate for that. Great. Th thank you for that feedback. We did have a very good meeting, and this is my uh, a degree is in environmental health, and I've worked on water quality and hunger issues and yeah. Uh, yeah. A, a lot of the a lot of overlap there. And he even mentioned your follow up email, so you know the whole. Nine yards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there anybody else who would be interested in this one before we close it? Okay, so then we have Councillor Marshall, the primary, and Councillor Young as the alternate. Regional Toll Advisory Committee. I'm interested in this one. Wonderful. Anybody else? Mr. No? Kilcott. That's fine. I have a dog in this fight. <laughs> and I believe, because uh, this was fairly new, is this the one that Council Rylander was on? So the, there was at yes. least one conflict with the council meeting on a Wednesday council meeting. Um, I'm not sure if it. Okay, so we should be good. Okay, any um, anybody wants to be alternate on this one, the regional tolls advisory committee. 
I'm shaking my head no. no. <laughs> <This> <laughs> well, I can be nice on this one and just that if, if um, Councillor Belcock can't attend, we'll talk about it at a council time and get somebody to go in your place. Yeah, and it looks like they have a virtual um, option. So if you don't want to commute to Portland, any takers? <laughs> Uh, the next one is the Regional Disaster Preparedness Organization. I'm going to ask that we pull this from today and I will add it to next week's council time. Um, they're raising their fees quite a bit um, and the work that we would, we haven't seen the work from our end that would benefit the county in my opinion, benefit the county and continue with the fees. However, we can still attend and still get information but they have not done anything specifically for Clark County. Um, so I would like to bring more additional information to council during a council time to make that decision. Uh, the Southwest Washington Regional Health Care Advisory Committee, twice a year. Well, shouldn't you do that since you're on the Public Health <laughs> Advisory Committee? That's what happens. And I think uh, I was on it for a while. I, I think you are either, it's a rotating chair or co-chair automatically. But it, it's a great organization. All right, I'm there. <laughs> Councilor Marshall, thank you. Uh, anybody want to be the alternate? I'll be the alternate. Thank you, Councilor Mapaji. Okay, Southwest Clean Air Agency. It's a nice group. The same. Well, the executive director is very nice. <clears throat> who did that before? I don't recall who did it. Hmm. I'm down with a check mark for having been in that role, but you know what? I don't remember ever going. So I think I think I wasn't actually. In that. I, I see in the one it that's looks, posted here, I'm not listed. So is this I the one that was. does it note that they haven't had a meeting in two years? <laughs> no. Have I met in a few years? <laughs> no, but there are a lot of question marks okay. after their address. Yeah, so that, that's probably why you didn't attend Chair Bowerman. They haven't met in a few years. Oh. <laughs> so do you wanna do you wanna continue on that? No, that's board, okay. in case they meet? No. <laughs> I'll put you down as alternate. That's good. Okay. Who's the who's gonna be the primary in case they meet this year? Councillor Young? I would take another one for the team on this one, but it's a scheduling conflict for me. Okay. We'll let you go on that one. Any takers? Are we still on clean air? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> was that was that a volunteer? Did you just volunteer? No. Again, they haven't met in a few years, so they may not meet this year. I'll, I'll take that one. Thank you, Councillor Belcott. Move on. Southwest Washington Convention and Visitors Bureau. I have been on that group for a year or two, and I've got to say that is a fun group to be part of because you you uh, learn all of the things that are going on in the county, and there they are many. It's very interesting. I nominate Karen Bowerman. Oh, well, I'm happy to pass it on. I've done it for two years. <laughs> I, I have an interest in this. I think a lot of the rural county, there's a lot of visit, visiting opportunities. That's very true. And they talk about that. Chair Bowerman, do you want to be the alternate? Sure. Thank you. Urban County Policy Board. Okay. I would be in this one too. Oh, are you? Wait. 
I, I would be willing to be on that one. Uh, you can do rock, paper, scissors. Okay. If it's important to Councillor Marshall, she can have that. Okay. I'd be happy to serve as alternate. Thank you. Washington State Association of Counties Board of Directors or WASAC. I that have done I would that and would be happy to continue. But I don't know, is Councilor, are you on that board I'm, currently? I'm on, normally, or just past history, the Board of Directors was the chair and then I had, uh, John Blum had done the steering committee before me. I don't go back much farther than that. And uh, so I, I am not doing the director board. I am doing the LSC, which I'm anxious to have someone else step into. So uh, for the, so for the WASAC, do, WASAC do you know legislative, I didn't know. Councilor um, Young, did you express an interest in that or? I'd be willing to, yeah. Okay. Chair, do you want to continue on that um, or be an alternate? Councilor Young would be willing. The board to... is good. I could understand. I didn't hear. Oh, could you hey. say that again? I'd be happy to continue on the board. Did We're you... on WASAC still? Yes. Yeah, um, oh. So. So Councillor Young is also interested in this. Uh, do you want to oh. maintain or be an alternate or Councillor Young, do you? Uh, I'm okay if, if uh, Councillor Bill or Bowerman wants to continue. I'm totally okay you know, with being I'm an sorry. alternate. I'm sorry, Councillor Young, I thought you were talking about the legislative steering group when you said that that was um, something you were interested in. Um, no, I'm, I'm uh, happy to relinquish the uh, board. Okay, I will we'll put down Councillor Young and Chair Bowerman, you'll be the alternate on that one. Sounds good. And there isn't a okay. requirement from WASAC on who serves there, is there? No, we don't believe so. And okay. is, this, is this the one that we just had the training? That training was available last week. Oh, let's see. Okay. Okay. So now on to the legislative steering committee for WASAC. I'm interested in that one. Okay. I will say I'm interested in that one, but probably for a future year, that one has got a time commitment that I'm not going to be able to fulfill. It is looks like a very interesting subject, though. Anybody else? Okay, so Councillor Belcott will be the primary and then the alternate. I could be the alternate on that. Okay, thank you. Workforce Development Council. And the next one is the same one as well. Workforce Development Council, it's the board or executive board. So it needs to be the same person for both. I've served on that. Um, either one or two years, I, I don't recall. And it is a one, just like the uh, economic development group, they are excellent to work with. It's a lot of fun, they're active. Um, I, I recommend it for somebody who enjoys that workforce development piece. Chair, would you like to serve as the primary on these? You know, I, I've already got uh, 21 groups and I think in order to do a good job, I probably ought to limit that. So I would kind of like to pass this one on. When done well, you can really engage with it in a, in a wonderful way. So I'd like to see it be someone else actually. Okay. Any other counselor? You get to go to McMinimums. I know, that looks good. <laughs> and then the other meetings are virtual. Oh, 
Come on. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll step up. Thank you, yeah. Councillor Marshall. Thank you. <laughs> and do we have an alternate? Y'all have learned. Everybody's looking down. <laughs> I have a scheduling conflict with this one as well. So do I. Okay. So, Councillor Mevaji, or I would like to have a scheduling conflict. Right. But okay. I, okay. So, I guess I'm the alternate. Councillor Mevaji is the alternate. Um, and so I think that's all of these. So we need to go back up to Echo. Um, that requires two counselors. It's once a month. It's on CBTV. The county chairs, correct? So whoever, um, one of the counselors who's on this will be the chair. Uh, it does involve also other cities that attend, um, other organizations that support this program in the community, staff, policy um, staff as well. I'm sorry, what's the name of this one? Echo. Oh, you're talking. Uh, we're back, back at Echo. <laughs> I thought, I, you know, I'm looking. There's no. Yeah. On. Sorry. Okay. Yes, we're back up at Echo. It's the last one we need. Oh my gosh. Okay. What if I hear? We're back to Echo. I think Sorry. we already reconfirmed that Councilor Mabichi <laughs> is on it again, correct? And so we were uh, looking between the other two volunteers, uh, Councilors Belcott and Young. Okay, I, I nominate Michelle Belcott for the second seat on Echo. I'll second that. So, I, the only further discussion I would have is, um, we did have some hiccups in a recent meeting, um, and I think uh, I would, you know, Michelle's expressed an interest in it. I would like to see. Um, someone a little bit farther outside of uh, downtown Vancouver uh, on the echo, because we, we have Vancouver very heavily represented already as stakeholder groups, um, pretty much everybody other than the cities um, are within Van the city of Vancouver, downtown Vancouver. Anyway, that's those are the only additional comments I would make. Chair, can I make some comments? Sure. First of all, I feel like I've been very gracious and passed on many opportunities, and this would probably be the only the only board that I came in with the intention of being a part of this morning. Um, second of all, uh, I'd like to expand a little bit about on the comments before the interest of the county is to end homelessness, and I don't think the interests of the county and the city vary from that. I think it's really important to recognize that I have immersed myself in this subject and spent an enormous amount of time and it is important to me. And yes, I do agree that the city of Vancouver is, is well represented, but I also believe that the bulk of the problem lies in the city of Vancouver. And um, I'm dedicated to working with both organizations I don't see my connections or my relationships with individuals in the city as a negative, I see it as a positive because we are going to have to work together to solve this terrible problem that we're experiencing in our community. I, I, on behalf of District 2, we do have an issue too because it does go down to Hazeldale and um, up to Salmon Creek, and believe it or not, I mean, we have some major issues specifically on the off-ramps that I've been very involved with. I've talked to James Casper, who has a drug rehab facility <clears throat> off of 78. Um, when I was campaigning, I was heavily involved. I have not had a chance to talk to Jamie with the city, but we do, believe it or not, have a pretty severe homeless camp. They're just hiding in the bushes. They're not as obvious where I, I totally understand D1 because I grew up in D1, um, but we do we do have an issue in D2 as well. I'm just putting it out there. I think also relative to the discussion is that I, I sit on the board of NAMI, Southwest Washington National Alliance on Mental Illness. So mental illness, homelessness, those are both subjects that are that I'm very passionate about and very much a part of that discussion uh, that would end my comments. 
you're on the mental health uh, tax board, right? Uh, I can't find it. No, on the list I passed. Right now. I, I that is that is one of the many that I passed on that I was very interested in, but allowed somebody else to take that position. Uh -huh. Chair, do you wish to call for vote? Yes, I was just looking to see who was who was on mental health. I know I am. Well, I don't see it on the list right now. It's there. Um, ah, it's Councilor Medvedi and myself with Councilor Young as the alternate. Okay, thank you. So yes, there is that motion before us and, and let's uh, vote. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And those opposed say nay. Nay. It appears to be either two to one or three to one. So majority uh, rules in this case. So, uh, Councilor Bell. I did not vote, vote Chair. Chair. Oh, you didn't. Okay. I, no, I'm. I vote for myself to join that committee. You what? I vote for myself to join that committee. Okay. So that is. Then this, this is. This is Sue. I'm abstaining. I uh, I'm, we have an embarrassment of riches here, and I hope uh, everybody will still have an opportunity to participate. Yeah, homelessness is such a big topic. I would think that there would be many such opportunities, but we'll probably have to make them. Uh, but at any rate, uh, Councillor uh, Belcott, you are the representative for Echo. As the and vote Young, I, I would assume I can put you in as the alternate on Echo. Yeah, and just basically, based on what Sue Marshall said too, the the way this is structured uh, between all the cities, including Vancouver, you know, we don't make decisions at Echo that then impact policy. We take the policy decisions and then go back to our respective councils, and then so anything Echo would ha want to. Uh, pass on to the county for the county to take on would then come to the full council uh, to discuss and, and vote on. So we all have our respective sovereignties, if you will, uh, as a piece of uh, this homeless discussion. May I just ask Councilor Medvedi, are you um, particularly interested in continuing on the mental health sales tax uh, board for which you're currently signed up. Uh, uh, if that's something someone else really wants, I'm happy to step aside. I will tell you it is uh, rewarding, it's important, and it's a lot of work. Um, yeah, but I it agree. was uh, worth doing. So if, is that something you wanna arm wrestle me over? I'm happy to give on it. I'm not willing to arm wrestle over anything. But, but um, that's something you really want to do. I would really enjoy being on in that board, but that, that's, again, I'm also, you know, it, I, yeah, okay. I, I'm okay either way. I don't think it takes an arm wrestle. <laughs> I really don't. Um, so if Councillor Medvedi, if you would be willing to accept the alternate role there, and then we could put in Councillor Young as the uh, the main one. Would that be acceptable to all? Councillor Medvedi, Councillor Young, you is what I'm yeah. by all. Yeah, you too. yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, we again, we uh, whatever the mental health uh, board comes up and recommends, it's not just a rubber stamp. The whole council uh, does. You know, basically the committee vets what their selections, but the whole council, and believe me, I won't be a shrinking violet on issues that I'm um, really supporting. And one of those is jail services and our mental health treatment. I'm hoping that I could say, I mean, we've kind of fenced off money from the mental health sales um, tax fund, and we've got a good balance there. So I'm happy to switch, 
Um, just know that I will keep harping on the same things for the use of that money. That's that's great. And from uh, the uh, Law and Justice Committee, you'll probably have a say on that uh, use for the jail money anyway with sales tax with the mental health sales tax. Um, perhaps this is the clean copy, but if we could have that mailed to us, that would be terrific. Yes, we will uh, be emailing, looks like she's going to do it right now, but we will be emailing that um, to you today. And so just for next steps right now, so we'll move the other uh, meeting or the presentation to next week. Again, I'm not, we can continue that agenda to a future one as well. So there's no time commitment that it has to be all completed by next week. But we do have a notice council time. It's a very short agenda uh, for today that we're going to have to close recording this meeting and then start another recording um, 